Wait, hello. Hi, Steve. A couple of minutes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, uh, good the middle of the night, whatever the case may be. We have lots of uh, different time zones on this call today. Um, I want to welcome you all to the Aerospace Corporation uh, with the co-sponsoring co by the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety. We're putting on a two half day webinar um, calling it CubeSat ID and Tracking Industry Day, um, also known as CubeSat Confusion. Um, at this point in time, uh, my name, first let me know, uh, my name is Mark Skinner. Um, I'm a senior project leader for space traffic management with the Aerospace Corporation. I'm also a space traffic management working group lead for the IAAAS. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, uh, Dr. Andrew Abraham. Andrew is an engineering manager in the mission analysis and operations department at the Aerospace Corporation. He has predicted the re-entry of Tiagong-1 Chinese space station, studied the after effects of the Indian ASAT um, effort and leads efforts to integrate GPS data for space traffic management. Over to you, Andrew. All right, Mark. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker. Um, so let's welcome uh, retired Admiral Cecil Haney who has served as commander of U.S. Strategic Command from 2013 to 2016. Today, he is a member of the Board of Trustees at the Aerospace Corporation. The STRATCOM may be most famous for its nuclear deterrent mission. However, a lesser known responsibility for STRATCOM, at least at the time, was its mission in space domain awareness, which has now been transferred to Space Command. 
Due to Admiral Haney's experience, I've asked him to share with us a few of his thoughts of where we have been as a community and where we are going in the areas of space domain awareness, space traffic management, and satellite identification and tracking. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Haney. Well, thank you, uh, and Andrew and, and team here, uh, just for this opportunity. Uh, you know, what an exciting forum uh, you have here, uh, given all we have and what we continue to launch in space these days. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Andrew Abraham for allowing me to join you and inviting me to do so here. And I think many of you may be asking yourself, why is an old retired sailor kicking this event off? Uh, especially since I spent most of my career under the water, about as far away as one can get from outer space. <laughs> but, you know, I, as mentioned there, I had the privilege here of uh, not being a customer only of space, but uh, working at U.S. Strategic Command twice. Here, uh, first as a deputy commander, and then uh, after a two-year sabbatical uh, at Pacific Fleet, I got to come back uh, as the commander. And in each of these tours, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, U.S. Space Command as a combatant command today uh, that we have. So uh, coming up, uh, coming into this job as deputy, I was, of course, coming in with a rich nuclear background. Uh, but I had a lot of growing to do in terms of uh, what was going on in space and uh, what we needed to do as a combatant command to support the mission. So I'm excited. I was excited during each of those tours to dive deeply into this mission area and uh, see changes during that time frame. And it's just amazing to me since I retired there uh, at the beginning of 2017 how much has changed since then. The fact of the matter is though, we needed our assets to work in space to carry out all the other missions US Strategic Command had at the time. Nuclear deterrence, of course, uh, leading that pack of mission space, missile defense, cyber electronic warfare, combating weapons of mass destruction to name a few. But I can remember in both tours uh, asking myself um, and asking the team, how do we really understand what is going on in such a vast area of, of responsibility, outer space? Of course, they answered me, hey, not to worry, boss. We got this thing called the JSPOC out there in Vandenberg, California. And the, the 185th uh, Space Control Squadron to deliver space situational awareness and uh, how we detect, track, and identify all the man-made objects in orbit and use this data to maintain the foundational space catalog and provide support, conjunction, assessment, collision avoidance, and re-entry assessment. Now, my reaction to that answer, of course, was, boy, that's a lot. And of course, it drove a lot of additional questions as to how we get all the data to support this, how the data is generated, how is it validated, how is it assessed, and how is it packaged in such a way to allow us to uh, have timely information to avoid problems in space. So I like that term that was mentioned, CubeSat confusion, for example. Well, the more I dug into this, the more questions I had, of course, uh, you know, such as who manages traffic in space? What does custody really mean? You know, um, How do we interface with all the stakeholders in space? What are the international rules of the road to follow that we have in so many other of our domains? Being a sailor, of course, uh, the rules of the road, the nautical rules of the road have been a part of me uh, for a long time. Well, needless to say, I had a lot of growing to do and really enjoyed uh, this exposure to space situational awareness and space traffic management. But I looked at this rather expansive domain uh, and sort of gulped at where we were then, and particularly when I asked, well, what's, what size is 
are we able to track? You know, people would say, you know, the size of your fist, your commander. I said, but aren't there things smaller than that that are up there uh, based on collisions and what have you? So I looked at this rather expansive domain uh, and sort of compared it to the maritime domain that I'd spent a lot of time with, which also depends on situational awareness and established rules of the road. In fact, I was so thrilled as a mariner to see the development of what we call AIS, the Automated Identification System, an automated tracking system based on reports provided by vessels carrying a AIS transponder. And these would give you reports associated with the vessel's position, which way the vessel was going, what was the name of the vessel, so it was easier to communicate with it and what have you. So this AIS system truly helped us as a Navy navigate busy waterways, enhancing what we call maritime situational awareness, especially in some of our busiest uh, congested waterways where weather may impede visibility, such as navigating in the fog. I always remember my days in Tokyo Wan, for example, and just how busy that was. So I wanted to understand how this type of AIS approach was done in space, of course. Well, you can imagine the kinds of answers I received. And I was disappointed at how much of the cataloging and efforts associated with space situational awareness were just so manually intensive and not as timely and did not include continuous track. As we look at today, just the immense number of man-made objects that are moving around in space at incredible speeds, and even at the number of cube sites that are released on some launches in space, this area clearly is very important, this business of identifying and, 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 and tracking. I understand that even at the high school level, we're involved with small satellites, such as the one that was launched uh, called TJ Cube back in 2019. The first designed and built by high school students to be sent to space. And this was done in partnership with Norfolk Grumman and Orbital Science Corporation, I am to understand. What's unique is, you know, if we're doing it at the high school level, you can imagine all the way in, you know, on up how many of these are, are going into space. In fact, on that particular launch that day, I am to understand that we used a Minotaur 1 rocket and it was crammed with some 29 satellites that went up in space. And I look at that and say, boy, what an achievement. But boy, uh, I also understand India has the record now of some 104 satellites launched in space back in February of 2017. Yes, I was retired there. So uh, I, I unfortunately don't have any real data to say, okay, of that 104, launch from this polar satellite launch best vehicle, how, how uh, long did it take us to catalog all 104 of those? How long did it take us to crisply identify them? How long, how, how many of them failed uh, out of that launch that may not have matured, may not have been able to communicate even if it had power and wasn't dead on arrival? And who owned all those satellites? I understand India only owned three of them. So uh, clearly an international event of satellites. So uh, just putting together those glimpses and given the experts we have assembled here uh, on this august uh, uh, team of, of folks here for this industry day, I know you all have had your headaches, your share of other concerns in this particular area. And I look at it and I say, boy, uh, given this trend, while I may naively have compared it to maritime situational awareness, uh, there are some things that I hope can parallel to the point where we can get some perhaps regulatory uh, rules of the road to follow to help in this particular area, particularly as we look at uh, how congested uh, space has become, uh, particularly in low Earth orbit. Now, I don't want you to take away from my discussion here that this AI system we had in the maritime domain was so 
wonderful that it couldn't be spoofed, that people couldn't turn it off and what have you. It too has its limitations today. And there's a lot in the public press here about the spoofing of that particular system. So uh, I hope that uh, the lessons learned from some of that can migrate into the space domain here uh, going forward uh, so that uh, perhaps better approaches can be made uh, as we look at going forward. It's so great to see, at least on the anticipated list of participants uh, in this event, that we have satellite owners, many developing technology. We also have government regulators and uh, many, many more. And I just think it's so important in order for us to get at this uh, business that we, we need collaboration and we need the big brains working together uh, to get at this because as I look back at my first uh, business of coming in as a deputy commander and then as a commander of strategic command. And while we have a space command, we know that we need a better methodology to track and identify these littler satellites as we go forward in order for us to do more big things safely in space. So thank you for uh, allowing me to be a small part of this. I wish you the best as you go forward here, and hopefully I'll get exposed to the outcome of this webinar sometime in the future. Thank you, Andrew and team. Well, thank you so much, Admiral Haney. I really appreciate the remarks you were able to uh, provide today. Uh, so to stay on schedule, we'll have to move on uh, to our co-chair, uh, Mark Skinner, who's gonna give us uh, some opening remarks, Mark. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Admiral. I um, enjoyed the talk. Uh, let's get on with the show now. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, basically, we want you to remember a few things. This is a, an open source uh, thing. We haven't limited attendance to anybody. Uh, the workshop is being recorded. We were hoping that we'll be able to put this up for on-demand viewing uh, sometime in the not too distant future after the show has been done. Next slide, please. Uh, a few reminders, uh, everyone, please keep their, um, keep their, keep themselves on mute unless you're actually talking. Uh, if you would, please, this is not a Zoom happy hour. Uh, if you could put your full name in your Zoom, your Zoom box so we know who's, uh, who's asking questions, that kind of thing. Uh, if you have any experience, any troubles with Zoom, you know, look at the troubleshooting tips. Um, we do have a chat function, which is being monitored. Uh, that's how you can make ask questions and make comments of the speakers. Uh, we anticipate from previous experience a lively uh, discussion session going on there. Uh, if we can, we will try to pick up some questions that come from there and, uh, and, and bring them to the attention of the speakers. Um, and you can see it down in the bottom, the, the chat thing is there on the little icon and you're welcome to use that. Next slide, please. I think we have a pretty good program put together for you. We have, uh, as, as the Admiral mentioned, we have regulators, we have uh, space operators, we have academia, we have industry, we have technology providers, we have owner operators, we have uh, systems engineering, uh, we have uh, lots of different people. I think we've got the right people in the room here. Um, and there'll be another four hour session tomorrow. The, the sessions were staggered to allow the inclusion of folks from not only Australia, New Zealand and Tokyo, but also Europe and Africa and uh, North America. Uh, so the time zone can, thing can be quite the challenge. Next slide, please. So why are we here today? Short answer up front. Uh, there's a problem, and I think we've got the right people in the room, so to speak, to solve the problem. Um, you've seen what we've got in store. We've got lots of different kinds of folks that uh, have a piece of the, this puzzle. Nobody has all the pieces. Nobody has all the answers, but I think together uh, we can come up with something that will be allow us to do this. It's not just a technical solution. There's regulatory pol and policy things involved. There's system engineering and other engineering kinds of solutions that are gonna come into this. Um, the problem is uh, what to do about small um, CubeSat sized objects that get launched, uh, especially when they're launched on Moss, and you can't tell one from the other. Uh, 
that's the problem. Um, and it's it's growing as, as we launch more and more of these. Uh, there, we're not trying to find one silver bullet that's gonna do everything, uh, but rather it's gonna be a lot of different things that allow us to mitigate this. Next slide, please. I think this, this chart from ESA, uh, thank you, Leticia, um, Francesca Leticia, uh, kind of illustrates very well the, the symptom that we've got here and uh, showing that uh, we have uh, bulk CubeSat launches and there's a number of them here. They, they get sent up and everything is thrown off the side and you can't tell um, which one is which uh, 100%, you see that some of them go to 100%. The y-axis is the fraction that has been identified. X-axis is days since launch. And you can see that even after weeks to months, uh, potentially forever, uh, we haven't been able to identify all the, all the CubeSats and nanosats that got launched. Uh, and we wanna find out how we can make these curves uh, different so that you can do this. If you have, um, you know, 75% of the objects are, uh, are identified, that means 25% aren't. If that's, you've got 100 launches or 100 CubeSats being launched, that's 25 things you don't know what they are. Um, you can identify or you can you know, figure out that the different combinations of labels to objects, 25 factorial, if you plug that into your calculator, you will get a very large number in the, I believe, quintillions. Um, anyway, next slide, please. So, um, the results of, of doing this, of, of you know, not identifying all the, all the objects are suboptimal. Um, you have the unhappy CubeSat owner operators. They've been working on this project for a while um, and then they launch and things don't go and they can't tell which one is which. And so, you know, I, I've been there. Uh, it's, uh, the tears are involved. You're, we're talking uh, uh, unhappiness. Um, it's a big letdown. Uh, regulators, uh, they, if you can't identify, as you'll hear in our, maybe our first panel, if you can't identify an object, you can't register it with the UN and fulfill your international treaty obligations. Also launching things that go up and you can't identify them and they're dead, that's sort of akin to launching space debris. And that's at odds with the currently accepted guidelines and regulations. And then the SSA providers, uh, the STM providers, um, that's extra work for them to try to to maintain the catalog and who do you contact if there's a close approach? Um, no one's happy. Uh, we want to fix this. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, what are the what are the some of the causes of this? I'll go briefly. You can read the chart, but you know, they're small. They look alike. Uh, a lot of times they're launched um, by teams that are maybe less experienced or teams that are going quickly. And so they use low cost things. Uh, you know, they don't use space qualified parts. This is not to knock CubeSats at all. Uh, they, the beauty of them is that they can be done fast and, and quickly and inexpensively, but some of these advantages can cause some of the problems that we're seeing here. Uh, sometimes they don't have room for redundancies. Uh, the small size can make them physically challenging to get in there and work on them without breaking something. Um, there, things are, people are going fast. Sometimes schedules are compressed and limit, with limited testing. Uh, lack of self-healing, um, and maybe, you know, they don't have the means to independently identify. So let's go on to the next slide. So how can we solve this? Um, we're going to talk about that today. There's a number of different things that we want to we want to work on. I think it's all possible. Um, and in the meantime, a uh, little self-promotion, we have a, a companion paper uh, to this uh, that just came out from the Center for Space Policy and Strategy. And I put the download instructions in the chat near the top. Additionally, we have uh, on Thursday, we have an edition of the Space Policy Show that will be a wrap up uh, with, my, with Andrew and myself on this. And with that, I think the next slide is getting me off the stage, at least for this. Yes. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague at Aerospace, uh, Dr. Joseph Kohler, who is a systems director at the Center for Space Policy and Strategy. And he's uh, been with Aerospace for three years and he came from the office of the Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. His, uh, his portfolio includes regulatory affairs, traffic management and space flight safety. Um, and he's also the award-winning showrunner for the CSPS Space Policy Show. Over to you, Joseph. 
Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Award-winning. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, no, no, uh, no Academy Awards yet. So we're waiting, waiting to hear back from them, of course, soon. But thank you very much, Mark, for um, hosting this really interesting event. Um, I've been very interested in this particular topic for for many years. Uh, so, for example when it was still at Los Alamos National Laboratory, I sponsored specifically a program. Back then we called it uh, Blinky. I think now it's called Elroy. But the idea is really how can we make um, small satellites more visible, more trackable, because it really will help the space economy. It will help the space traffic management on many different levels. So I sponsored a, a small little program and I'm, I'm glad to hear that the program is still continuing. Um, secondly, while I was at the office of the Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, uh, we also ran into an issue at one point and many of you might still remember uh, called Swarm. Uh, Swarm turned out to be uh, satellites that are smaller than one CubeSat. And I was involved in the interagency uh, discussions regarding that particular topic. Um, and so I'm glad that Mark, you're hosting, Mark and Andrew, you guys are hosting this uh, industry days on uh, small satellite identification because I think it's really important issues. Uh, satellites, um, you know, I see some similarities to cell phones. In, um, 20 years ago, people sort of predicted cell phones are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And yes, technology is getting more, um, uh, you know, smaller and, and lighter weight, but it really was turned around by the screen size. People still want to have a, a large screen so they can see it. So this was the transition back then. Um, is a similar paradigm true for small satellites? Maybe, maybe not. Um, on one hand, you can say, well, unless there's really a breakthrough in power supply through solar cells with small satellites, um, satellites do tend to get smaller because technology and uh, the circuitry gets smaller and lot more lightweight. And so that also reduces launch cost, right? So if a smaller satellite can provide similar capability, why not use the smaller satellite, right? So there is a, a there is a bit of a trend. I would really say it's it's going to keep continuing down, down that road, but there is obviously a need. Uh, there is obviously a need to identify smaller satellites, as um, Mark pointed out earlier with the chart. Uh, it does take a while to positively attribute each single track, satellite track, to the right owner. And so this is a really important issue. So uh, with that, we have put together a fantastic panel, of, uh, uh, including some of my former government colleagues. Um, and I want to introduce them each by each. And um, I hope everybody's online. I think, uh, oh, I see David is here as well. Yeah, he had, I think, maybe some technical difficulties earlier. But I think we're all here. And so I'm going to uh, introduce my panelists. And then I give you guys uh, two or three minutes. You can make your main points. And then we go into a uh, discussion mode. We've exchanged a uh, a few questions um, to solidify the discussion on this topic, but I'm also monitoring the chat window. So people in the audience, if you wanna um, type in any of your questions and I will sort through them and um, you know, as, as time permits, um, we'll, we'll get to those as well. But with that, I wanna start with uh, Marissa Velez. Uh, Marissa is the Chief of Satellite Policy Branch within the Satellite Division of the FCC, uh, the International Bureau. And in this role, Marissa is leading a team addressing legal issues associated with the licensing and regulatory of satellite systems, including review of satellite applications, of course, and rulemaking activities. And so, uh, Marissa and her team that were very uh, strongly involved in all the recent um, rulemaking and procedures and so forth. So thank you for all your hard work, Marissa. Um, within the FCC Satellite Division, um, Marissa has focused on issues such as streamlining the rules of small satellites and 
mitigation of orbital debris. And I want to hand it over to you, Marissa, for a couple of statements. Hello, good afternoon. Um, very glad to have the opportunity to take part in this event today. Um, as noted, I'm the chief of the satellite policy branch within the satellite division of the FCC. So I wanted to provide a, a very quick background on the FCC's role in satellite licensing, and then also talk a little bit about- um, Please hold on, we're experiencing technical difficulties. Sorry. At least some of us were able to hear her okay, so heads up on that. All right, is it is it working now? It is for me. Okay. Marissa, you sounded uh, great on my end. Okay. Sounds good here. Likewise here. Right. Yeah, okay. I can hear you fine. This is Diane. All right. I suggest we press ahead. There are some folks who cannot hear. If you uh, are in that category, you can dial in with your phone and listen along, it comes in through the phone. All right, I will, um, I'll, I'll move ahead as suggested. Um, so I just wanted to um, also talk a little bit about how um, the considerations about identification of CubeSats or other small satellites fit within the overall application framework at the FCC. Um, so, Kind of stepping back, um, in the US, the FCC is the authorizing entity for the use of radio frequency spectrum for commercial, experimental, and amateur satellites, um, essentially any non-governmental satellites. Um, as part of the application process for a license or authorization at the FCC, satellite applicants provide technical information regarding the satellite or system and this includes information about how the operator plans to mitigate orbital debris. So in 2018, uh, the FCC adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking that made proposals and sought comment on a variety of updates to the commission's orbital debris mitigation disclosure requirements. Um, these uh, orbital debris mitigation rules actually had not been comprehensively updated since 2004. So um, there were a wide range of topics covered in the 2018 um, notice. Among these were some proposals related to satellite archability, identification, and sharing of location information. Um, we had a, a fairly extensive record that was developed in response to the notice of proposed rulemaking. And the commission um, reviewed the comments we received in the record and um, ultimately adopted final rules in April of last year. Um, and these rules included some disclosures related to trackability and satellite identification. So um, as to trackability, the FCC essentially adopted a presumption uh, that satellites larger than 10 centimeters in their smallest dimension are presumed trackable in low Earth orbit. Um, and then for cases where the satellite is smaller than that, um, we would ask for additional information to support a demonstration of trackability. Um, on satellite identification, the commission adopted a rule requiring that applicants disclose how the operator plans to identify the satellite following deployment. In adopting this rule, the FCC stated its intent to emphasize the importance to operators of planning for satellite identification in advance uh, so that they are able to troubleshoot potential issues. Uh, the commission also adopted a requirement that applicants disclose um, whether the satellite will be registered with the 18th Space Control Squadron or successor civilian entity. Um, here, the commission emphasized the importance of operators sharing information with a central entity that can provide space situational awareness support. So um, just speaking in general, the FCC you know, has recognized the importance of tracking and identification of satellites 
and um, adopted these requirements last year. Um, in so doing, the commission also worked to ensure that there was enough flexibility in the rules to accommodate um, the continued evolution and advancements in um, space situational awareness and space traffic management functions as they relate to uh, non-federal operations. Um, and so that, that's what I wanted to say um, in introduction and, and happy to cover any of my earlier points um, during the Q&A if, if folks um, weren't able to hear initially. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, our next panelist, uh, Dr. David Murakami. Thank you very much for joining our industry day today. He's an aerospace engineer at NASA, uh, where he's applying the lessons and technologies developed for space traffic management and air traffic management to the space domain. Uh, he has worked on a number of and diverse uh, range of projects, including the Lunar Heritage Site Protection Guidelines, and wind tunnel testing of rockets and aircraft, and a number of other very interesting uh, um, items. Uh, so his portfolio is rather broad. Um, in his current role, he's developing a distributed and open architecture system for managing space traffic management data flows. And that's among numerous and diverse space operators. And so welcome to today's industry day. Uh, Dr. Murakami, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I just have a couple of points that I'd like to make in the beginning here. So I think this being a US government panel, uh, the other panelists being regulators, the FAA, FCC, Department of Commerce. Um, NASA is not a regulator, right? We don't make laws and enforce them, we do research. And that's a very different set of constraints. And I think that's uh, something that is very important to uh, the development of space traffic management, especially for this sort of new domain, uh, for this plethora of CubeSats that we're seeing. So NASA does things like uh, crash an airliner in the desert to figure out how to make them safer, do um, human in the loop air traffic controller simulations to make the uh, air traffic uh, control system more efficient, uh, do all of this sort of testing and development uh, to figure out concepts to get data to properly inform regulators so they um, come up with the best rules and the best ways to enforce them and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's, that's important. So there is, in the domain that we're talking about right now, I also want to point out that there's uh, sort of what I think is the technical, technical sort of issues, like how do you make a beacon with uh, a good enough, you know, uh, isotropic radiated power or um, battery supplies or things like that, orbit determination. Uh, and I think a lot of the community, we naturally being engineers focus on things like that. Uh, but I think at this point, we're coming into uh, a different kind of squishier set of problems involving managing and communicating information. So when a community is small, you can make all of these unique point-to-point -point connections between everybody in order to uh, get the information where it needs to go. But when it gets big and when it gets diverse, uh, that just doesn't work. Like when the network scales up, you um, run into, it, it takes on a life of its own. It becomes a problem in and of itself that needs to be addressed like any of these other sort of very technical problems that maybe a lot of us are used to thinking of. Um, and in that, uh, along those lines, uh, I want to say that NASA Ames has a really long history of working in air traffic management research and development. And so this specific project that I'm working on is kind of an outgrowth of, uh, of that. And I think a good example of what NASA's role should be. So uh, back several years ago, um, there were these announcements, right? Amazon and Google Wing, so they were going to make uh, delivery drones. There were gonna be a lot of drones in the air doing things that they hadn't done before. Um, and it was evident that this could be a problem. You know, you're talking about millions of drones. You need ways to communicate with them. Uh, you need to, for example, tell everybody to clear a certain piece of airspace if there's a, uh, you know, a medical ambulance helicopter coming in. So those are sort of traffic management problems. And we came up with uh, a novel way of addressing that problem. So we saw this problem. Um, we had a bunch of smart people think about it. We came up with a 
a set of ideas, sort of a solution. Uh, we then worked with the FAA, and now that system, UTM, Unmanned Aerial System Traffic Management, is being picked up. It's being handed off to the FAA. Um, and, you know, at that point, it's, it's going to become a regulatory issue rather than sort of a, uh, just a research sort of thing. And I think that's a good description of this division of labor that I think works here. Um, and specifically for the future of CubeSets that we're seeing here, I think there's a lot of parallels there. Like you mentioned cell phones before. I also think that uh, drones are kind of a, a good example. So going from big manned aircraft to these uh, a lot, lot more small, relatively cheap unmanned aircraft that can be operated by pretty much anyone. Um, the main problem that comes up there is really about scaling. So the approaches that you took with manned aircraft, you know, human air traffic controllers spending a lot of time over each one of these things, that's, that doesn't scale. So we came up with something that uh, is a lot more decentralized. Uh, sort of traffic, the idea being that we make the traffic system manage itself uh, as much as um, as much as possible and as, as much as safe. Um, and the uh, the work that we're doing here, the uh, sort of AIMS STM prototype that we've been working on, the idea is kind of to create a uh, something like an API ecosystem for space. So if you're talking about the world of apps, you know, um, Uber, Twitter, things like that. So those, you know, the thing that makes them possible is really infrastructure. So if you have an idea for an app, you have, uh, you know, you get an AWS account, you get Salesforce, you plug those two things together and then you have something that works. Um, the barriers to entry are relatively low and the infrastructure exists. And that's uh, mostly, uh, that's a lot about standards, right? Everybody talks the same language and everybody can get information flowing between things uh, as, uh, as they need to. But once you have a critical mass, once you have the participants involved with services that are desired, once you have the means for everybody to communicate with each other, it kind of takes on a life of its own and they identify problems and you know, fill in niches by themselves. Uh, without, as third parties, without, for example, the government having to go in and solve a particular problem. Thank you very much, David. Um, you bring up some important points that I think we're going to discuss uh, throughout this panel and probably throughout the whole um, series of presentations over the next, uh, of today and tomorrow. Uh, but let me also introduce uh, my next two guests on the panel, uh, Steph Earl. Um, Steph and I actually worked uh, uh, a couple of years ago together on, on a number of different issues involving space traffic management uh, between the DOD and uh, the FAA. And it's good to have you back, Steph. Um, he is uh, with the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, uh, where he's an acting deputy division chief. And he has been a subject and leading expert uh, for the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation in numerous national space policy initiatives, including space traffic management, like I said earlier, orbital safety for launch and reentry vehicles, um, orbital debris mitigation practices, and uh, also national space and cyberspace practices. So over to you, Steph. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, um, over to you for some initial remarks. All right. Thanks, Carl, um, um, Joseph. And um, thanks, Mark, as well, for inviting me to today's event. So uh, I'll try to keep my comments a little bit briefer so we can uh, have more time for the question and answer period. So as you mentioned, I come from the launch side of this and the evil empire regulator side. So uh, my viewpoint of, of CubeSat confusion may be a little bit different. Um, the areas that we have for, for launch, when we talk about CubeSats, and there are, there are basically two sides that we're talking about here, which is, you know, we reap what we sow. You know, we want more spacecraft and we have more spacecraft. And so we, we have now got the benefit as well as the burden for that. And so when we look at the CubeSats for us, there's a pre-launch, and there's a launch and there's a post-launch portion of this. And then pre-launch, CubeSats are, are, are easy 
they're very easy to, I'm gonna add this one, I'm gonna subtract this one. And so the manifest can be a little difficult to nail down, like what is the country or the commercial operator actually launching? Um, so that, that's a challenge with CubeSats because they are so easy to replace. Um, there's also an issue with the predicted safety. So when we do a launch, we wanna know that we're launching into a safe place and a safe environment. And so we wanna make sure that we're not gonna launch directly into a collision. Small sats are very difficult because a lot of times they're, they're, they're released in mass, large numbers of them. And so doing the analysis pre-launch, it's a lot harder to do than it is when you have orbital objects that you're doing it. So, so pre-launch safety is a very difficult task once you start adding up the sheer numbers of uh, small sets that are launched in a single launch vehicle sometimes. And then we've got identification and registration. Uh, and so this is the CubeSat confusion that Mark was referring to earlier. If you, you can't identify an object, you can't register it. And so that, that becomes a challenge. Some owner operators might be able to find their payload, but they don't know which one is which. Um, two objects operating close to each other, neither have maneuverability. They both have radios of different frequencies. You can talk to them. You can get all kinds of science, but you won't know which one's which. And, and so it's very difficult to register. And so if you go back into the public catalog, you'll find many objects recently launched that are never identified. And we can't really attribute those objects. And so there's a liability issue for that. And then when I say we reap what we sow, what we're finding is, is that we are really packing orbit, uh, packing them with satellites. And if and you wanna say, do we protect them all to the same scale? Do I, you know, we all recognize that human spaceflight is a special type of spaceflight. We wanna protect that the most. But then when we get to active payloads, we start getting to this payload is operating uh, for 14 years and it's this size, but this payload is operating for 14 days. And it's, you know, it's a one U CubeSat. So do we protect them both at the same size? And those impacts are things that we as regulators are looking at. Um, the Department of Transportation has always looked at things and stratification is what we do. I've said this before, CubeSats are kind of like the analogy of, of bicycles. You know, eventually we had to take bicycles off most highways. I it was pointed out to me that they're, they're still allowed as a mean of transportation, if there's no other road, you can still go, but that doesn't mean it's safe. If you wanted to ride your bike on I-95 to Washington, I would recommend against it. Um, and many of the other roads around DC uh, stick to the bike paths, but we don't have bike paths for CubeSats. We don't have a bike lane or a CubeSat lane. They're in with everyone else. And so there are some issues that go along with that that we still are working on. and. Uh, what I want to avoid is that, that, you know, the squirrel doctrine where CubeSats believe that they're so small that they don't matter because they do. And so there are a lot of issues that we still have to fall through. So I'll, I'll defer the rest of my um, responses to our question and answer because I, I know we're getting short on time. Thank you so much, Steph. Uh, interesting comment to come to talk about bike lanes in space. Um, so my next uh, esteemed guest is uh, Dr. Diane Howard. Thank you very much for joining us today. She is the Chief Counsel for Space Commerce at the US Department of Commerce. Um, in addition to providing space law expertise to the Office of Space Commerce and the Department of Commerce as a whole, she also participates uh, a lot in the interagency work and is actively involved in the Office of Space Commerce SPD3 implementation. Over to you, Diane, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, and I'll try to make my comments brief. Um, my office, uh, well, we are regulators, advocates, and enablers. So we are, right now, we're in that squishy place that David talked about um, as we build out the open architecture data repository. And everything that my fellow panelists have talked about are all the reasons why this is so difficult. Um, it's These are very complex and complicated issues. Um, I will tell you that the, the things that I keep hearing over and over again are issues that we've dealt with through our request for information back about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, um, through our work with the Commercial Orbital Debris Interagency Working Group, through our industry days, all of the different responses that we've, we've started to call through. And 
you know, it's it's almost like I'm ready to write a song about these things, trackability, transparency, and maneuverability. Like, you know, we're gonna write a song and we can all sing it when we're on panels together. But some of the things that we're thinking about, I mean, there's, there's obvious utility and how many uh, different available options there are for trackability and identification from small beacons and corner reflectors. They're, they're low cost, they're low mass. It all makes, it, it, it seems so obvious. And, and, and transparency seems on the face of it to be such a, such a, 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 a simple solution. We're really looking at how do we define what is proprietary information at this point as we build out the open architecture data repository, because right now, you know, there's, you can run, but you can't hide. So how, how, how much difference does it really make when you have so many diverse observation systems? So, you know, what are we protecting if we aren't completely transparent? So we're looking at ways that we can build that kind of information into a, a an, a catalog that uh, is is not more information, but better information, more actionable information as we go forward. And and uh, you know, I, I've my my colleagues have talked about maneuverability, and and I think Steph mentioned stratification. So we're looking at all of these different things. And at the end of the day, I think I want to leave you with this thought. I mean, there's an obvious reward in um, implementing these things that we're talking about with regard to CubeSats. And it's a hard one because there's a balance. They're very small. You don't want to raise the cost. You want to increase access. You want innovation. But at the same time, we are re re reaching very packed orbits in critical mass. So how do you incentivize those, those behaviors that, that you want, that, that identifi and identification and trackability? You can build it into your licensing. Um, and, and we are, we heard from Marissa and she is, but there are so many different ways that we can incentivize. For instance, we can give gold stars, but we can also maybe have better, uh, you know, regulatory experiences for those that do um, exercise better compliance that are, are, are better um, citizenry in the space environment. Um, and, and perhaps that's what we need to look at is, you know, not just discounted or, or better insurance premiums for the future, but, maybe making present regulatory decisions based upon past performance. And I think that that's something that we need to think about. We need to think about what shape can incentives look like so that we can get these behaviors going because it will be it will benefit all of us. Thank you, over. All right, thank you very much, Diane. Um, yeah, definitely see the, the issue of, uh, it's actually twofold for space traffic management. One is you have to better determine uh, what the orbit is, and if you know, and you know, secondly, if you know uh, more precisely where the orbit is, you can also uh, have more traffic, right? So that that analogy also goes with where air traffic management came from, with uh, using the WAS uh, GPS system to allow more precision landings of airplanes, which allows the same airspace to be uh, used by more airplanes, right? And so uh, my, my first question actually is going to Marissa. And, uh, you know, as, she, as Marissa described earlier, she has worked uh, very diligently um, on the proposed rulemaking and the rulemaking. And she noted the, um, you know, the, the request for additional information if the satellite is smaller than the adopted assumption of a, a CubeSat size of uh, 10 by 10 centimeters. And um, what, what, so over the next day or two, we are going to discuss different types of technologies that are available. Um, but where do you see um, where, uh, is, is there a future where some of these technologies could be made a requirement either through the FCC or uh, another regulatory agency or the FAA? Um, and, and wh wh where, is, wh where are we going? Is this, um, is this where we're heading or are you trying to uh, be in this area where you promote and also protect the public good of outer space and the use of spectrum um, by um, you know, requ requesting additional information, sort of leave it open to the applicant, right? Um, long question short, you know, do you see a regulatory future for satellite identification? Uh, sure, so it's it's an interesting question. And, um, you know, we did have a, a number of folks come in um, with comments um, back over the last couple of years um, with some of the thoughts on this issue and, and suggestions. Um, and 
I think ultimately, and I think that the, the commission said this in the orbital debris um, order that it, it ultimately adopted, but it's, um, you know, there's an expectation that it's likely to be an iterative process in terms of the development of regulation. Um, right now, we have a, a further notice of, of proposed rulemaking where, you know, we accepted comments on that in the fall um, with questions about maneuverability, for example. And so, um, you know, I think that's an example of how this is an iterative process. Um, I, at the time, you know, we adopted the, the rules that, are, that have now been adopted, um, the decision was to, um, you know, not prescribe any specific requirement for um, some kind of technology that needed to be used um, to ensure trackability, but also, you know, to um, kind of adopt a presumption of um, trackability for CubeSats 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters and larger, um, and then have, you know, some flexibility also there to consider um, demonstrations on, on sort of a case by case basis for things that are smaller. So it's, it's a balance in terms of wanting to provide, you know, certainty as well as wanting to allow for um, different types of ways of uh, meeting the, the kind of overall regulatory requirement um, to help ensure trackability. Um, but as I said, I think, you know, it's likely to be an iterative process um, going forward um, as, as technology, you know, continues to, to change and there's new ideas about the best ways to accomplish the, what the overall goal is. Um, I don't know that that, you know, will involve a specific technology, um, uh, but, you know, it's something that I think um, we're certainly, um, you know, looking at as we go forward. All right, thanks, Marissa. I, I definitely agree. It's a, a uh, good first step to ask for additional info. And if an applicant uh, provides uh, and uses technology that facilitates or aids the small satellite tracking and identification, and uh, then your office can look at it uh, based on the information provided and make a decision based on that. Um, Diane, I really wanted to pull on the thread earlier uh, regarding the rap song that you're proposing we write on um, technology, sustainability, utility, liability, and so That's forth, right? right? right. But, transparency, but, maneuver, but yes, absolutely. All the things that end in E, yep. Right, but let's, let's preserve that for some other time. Um, I would like to ask you, based on your international background and experience, expertise, right, on international law, um, where do you think um, what should be done or where there's an opportunity? Because let's face it, the United States is not the only country launching CubeSats, right? And we're not the only country talking about small satellite identification, but where, where can this be taken to a broader international level? Um, are we there yet? Is there an interest from, um, from international partners or agencies or, um, uh, you know, tell us a bit about the international playing field and opportunities with small satellite identification. The international community has been impacted by the events of the last nearly a year now, um, I have to say, you know, COPUS met uh, for the science and technical committee in, in uh, I believe it was February, and, and that, that part of our community has not met since in anything but a virtual setting and that has profound limitations, but I will say this. So, so what I'm going on is the things that happened prior to COVID. But I will tell you that um, there is awareness and interest from uh, all, most everybody who is uh, spacefaring because the impacts on the uh, space environment impact everybody in the space environment. So there's an awareness that we need. And I believe that there is a certain amount of uh, alarm from other countries because of the um, cadence with which we are granting uh, licenses to lots and lots and lots of, of uh, satellites um, to be launched. And so there is an awareness of this. So what, what can we do to uh, help navigate through this kind of um, situation where there's an awareness of a problem, there's some, some uh, concerns about the things that we are doing here in the US, what do you do? You, you do outreach and you do um, you message, you explain. Um, you, we, we all need to be talking about how the things that we do, as I said before, uh, the obvious reward is a safer 
more sustainable space environment. It benefits all of us. I think I've talked before about mutual benefit, and and it is mutual benefit, um, mutually assured benefit if we all get in, get on board. I think the pushback that you get from other um, members of the international community is, is the, the kind of pushback that you get even within our US community of, of CubeSat operators. And, and I think that is an, uh, a concern that there is going to be a requirement that's gonna make it economically um, in, not feasible for them to go for their missions and their business plans and or their research plans. And I think we need to be um, always mindful of ways to make this very accessible to all users of the space environment. I hope that it, I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you very much. I see there's also some questions in the in the uh, chat window. I'll, let's get back to those in a moment here. I want to um, um, one comment was uh, we also don't allow home built cars to drive on the highway without inspection to determine roadworthiness. That actually brings up an idea on space flight safety in general, right? I mean, uh, there's often an example I bring up if you uh, look at the uh, traffic rules of the road and uh, 100 years ago, there's actually a fantastic video you can find on YouTube uh, where you can see the traffic in uh, San Francisco in 1906 and it's traffic pandemonium, right? This was sort of pre highway lanes and sidewalks and, 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 and so forth, right? So I think as participants, um, the number of participants increases and the level of sophistication perhaps decreases, there is a need to protect that uh, greater good that leads towards long-term sustainability um, and, uh, and, and so forth. So I think it's very important to, to watch that evolution very carefully. Diane, I see your hand. I have my hand in the air because I, I have to jump in and say, but the, the something that you know sticks out from what you just said, and that is that um, the Outer Space Treaty grants all state parties uh, to that treaty freedom of exploration and use. And so there are many, and, and there is an awareness in, in all of uh, space law for developed and developing countries. And so I do appreciate the idea that homemade cars shouldn't be on the highway. However, it gets very sticky and it gets very sensitive when we start dictating to other countries what their exploration and use must look like. And so I'm not saying that that's not a, a noble and, 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 and very valid observation. I'm saying that it's it, it requires some care and some diplomacy in going forward and finding a way to to balance um, other countries and their interpretation of what exploration and use means to them and how that impacts the rest of us. And, and you know, one of the things that came to mind as you were saying that, Joseph, is that, um, you know, I used to teach in the De Daytona Beach and NASCAR has a huge uh, track and the cars that are ride riding on that track aren't the same as the cars that are riding on the highway. So, yes, I think that's what stratification is all about. Yeah, I mean, you, you can... Uh, ho have home-built airplanes too, and the FAA will certify those for, um, you know, you get a, um, a home-built license. I forgot exactly what the license is called, but there, you there's an a experimental. Problem. You, can get, right. you can get an experimental, but, but let's experimental see, license. Since, Don, uh, since Diane mentioned the Outer Space Treaty. So freedom is, is right, but there is a requirement in the Outer Space Treaty to avoid impacting others. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so... Yeah. Once we talk about safety and we talk about efficiency, which is, I mean, that's why the Department of Transportation exists. In all modes of transportation, we worry about safety first and then efficiency, and that enables all of the other things that we do. And so when we start talking about CubeSats and the number of CubeSats, one CubeSat, you're talking freedom. You're talking 1957, 1959 timeframe. When you start talking about 6,000 CubeSats, then, then you go back to my squirrel doctrine. You don't, you don't. All 6,000 squirrels can't attack my house. Okay, that's, that's the rule. <laughs> so there is a uh, requirement, in my opinion, for us to look at the collective impacts. And so a lot of times we see, you know, there was a question about, you know, um, you know can we put homemade cars on the road or not in different areas? And so this brings me to two different points. There's a carrying capacity for this medium. That, that's the mediums. And then there's a vehicle capacity that we would require. 
And, and the real question here is, are we seeing that the carrying capacity of these orbits is, is impacting what we believe to be the vehicle capacity requirements or capability requirements to access that medium? And that's where I really think that CubeSats are on the smallest side of that. And they are right there at the, at the edge where if we were to stratify, the concern has always been, we would stratify above where they are. That's where trackability comes in. People worry about uh, smallest objects and they might not be allowed to operate. Now, the orbital debris mitigation standard practices from 2019 updated already have a rule that requires a 100 object year permission for objects smaller than a one U CubeSat. So we, we are already seeing some type of limitation about the operations or freedoms of those spacecraft. And, and I think that that is balance. going to get more. I think we're going to see more of that as we learn more and as the carrying capacity gets tested for these orbits. Steph, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a balance. And I think what you're talking about, and that's Article 9, I, I believe that's what you're talking about when you say about the impacts on others. And that is that states, state parties must perform their activities with due regard for the corresponding interests of other state parties. And I think that's the balancing that we're talking about when you start looking at the carrying capacity and then the vehicle, the, the vehicles that are there. So I, I believe that um, all I'm say, suggesting is that we'd be mindful of the fact there are other ways to interpret. So I agree with you. Thanks. <laughs> There's a, another question from the audience, and I think uh, probably is best for Marissa. And actually, let me combine it with another question that came from, from Andrew himself. So the question is, assuming that satellites are getting smaller, right? And, um, you know, when, when you provide them with a license and a launch license and spectrum license, um, what, what's, how are you planning to look at when the uh, maybe that if there is a satellite identification involved, how does that work if uh, you know the satellite has completed its lifetime, right? So how about trackability after the lifetime of the satellite is an important issue. How are you planning to look at that? And a, a related question is, do you foresee um, you know perhaps do they require additional spectrum allocation? Uh, is there a need for maybe a, a specific infrastructure, a spectrum brand infrastructure to facilitate the uh, small satellite identification? Marissa, if you wanted to uh, take that question, that would be great. There you are. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, just going to the issue of the satellite identification, trackability, um, I think you know, the way that, that we've looked at it has been um, sort of as a throughout the satellite's time on orbit. Um, just to give a little bit more detail, I think in the way that we kind of look at some of these issues, um, at least, you know, have to date at the FCC, I think it's really important to think about trackability from day one of design. Um, and so if, if the design is kind of completed without any regard to trackability and, and you're trying to find a way to address it after the spacecraft is built, that's, that is likely to cause some significant issues. I mean, we, you know, as I said, we, we really um, treat, we really use that presumption of trackability and, and encourage folks um, to, um, to take that into consideration with the, the CubeSat or larger size um, as being trackable. And then, you know, again, to date, the, the cases where a satellite doesn't meet that criteria, um, typically it's been satellites really in the, the very low portions of LEO, um, certainly below 600 kilometers, and then, you know, well below that in a number of cases. Um, and we're looking at, you know, the specifics um, about, um, in some cases, they may be um, looking at a deployable an antenna or solar panel, panels or something along those lines to increase the, um, the, uh, the size of this, the spacecraft for purposes of trackability. And so there's a number of issues there that you can get into that are complicated about, you know, what's um, the reliability of that kind of a, a deployment. Um, and, you know, is it dependent on, for example, a commercial off-the-shelf processor that hasn't flown in space before? And so you, you get into kind of all these, these detailed issues, but I'll just back up to say that I was talking about that to kind of get at the issue of, 
of the way that we've dealt this, with this before, and that is really looking at it um, from a, a whole holistic perspective as far as the spacecraft being in orbit um, and not kind of distinguishing at least at this point between a time when the satellite's gonna be transmitting or operating and the time after that. Um, to the second question, which is, um, you know, presents a little bit different, but maybe related issue on spectrum allocation. Um, you know, there's always there's always a spectrum crunch. Um, you have terrestrial services and satellite services, um, and there's never enough spectrum for for either of them. Um, is, is sort of what we hear, and so there have been, um, you know, we've heard from different um, operators of you know, an interest in um, expanding certain allocations um, to accommodate additional satellite operations. Um, you know, there are satellite allocations um, you know, in a variety of frequency bands. And so those are where you know, most operators do operate. Um, a lot of them are shared with, for example, federal operations in the US or maybe with other types of operations. And so there's considerations depending on the frequencies that are, are being looked at. Um, and I think one of the, the challenges is that you have um, satellites, including CubeSats, doing a variety of different things in terms of the services that they're providing. Um, you have a lot that are very much experimental and they're operating, you know, unprotected, um, non-interference basis. And then you have um, very small satellites that are actually doing uh, quite a lot and do want to have protection for the, the types of, um, of services that they're providing. And so, it, it really is the cross of a number of different um, allocations within the, the spectrum allocations, um, as well as sort of needs from a spectrum perspective. Thank you, Marissa. I know we're getting pretty much to the end of our time here. Uh, a lot of interesting discussion points uh, are being made in the chat window, but I, I don't want to be remiss of David. Um, he, you brought up a, a interesting point earlier regarding infrastructure. Right, and um, you know, I'm aware that uh, the FAA is testing uh, infrastructure solutions for for drones, and and you, you know, you're probably aware of that too. But where where do you foresee where the, the critical infrastructure needs for small satellite identification? Uh, you brought up some points earlier, but uh, can you give us some more some more details? Who should be in charge? Do we need infrastructure developments on on those particular items? Yeah, right. And sorry for going long earlier, lost track of uh, how long I was talking. But um, yeah, I think that that is really an important question. So um, in terms of infrastructure, so I'll, I'll make an analogy to COVID, you know, so if we have a COVID vaccine, uh, that's not the whole problem. That's not the solution, right? You have to distribute it. And that kind of becomes its own uh own sort of technical challenge there. I think here we have something that's kind of similar. Um, we can have uh, perfect beacons, right? But uh, if only the operator knows where their satellite is not enough, like who, how do we bring that information together? How do we create sort of a, a common operating picture for whom, who gets to know what? That would make it easy for new entrants to come in and produce, you know, get into the network without having to reinvent wheels. Um, I think that's kind of broadly what I define as infrastructure. And I think, you know, we have the smartest people on the planet working on this kind of a thing. Um, we can create really good, uh, you know, beacons that last forever, can be recorded, you know, listened to by um, small inexpensive stations on the ground, but um, distributing and, uh, you know, actually using that information is um, a separate problem. And by infrastructure, what I was, you know, going on about before about like an API ecosystem, I think that's kind of a way to approach it. So create um, common standards, create sort of a, a critical mass of participants that makes it interesting and maybe profitable for people to get into. And then, you know, let third parties kind of do solving the problem for you in a in a certain way um yeah i, I don't want to go too long so that's i, I think yeah, that's kind of where you. i want to stop thank you very much david i wish i had another hour mark <laughs> can i have another hour i mean this has just been a, a great fascinating uh discussion very engaging chat window um i'm gonna uh i have another time slot uh, tomorrow to speak about space flight safety, 
uh, Space Safety Institute and regulatory issues. So I'm going to pull pull on some of these strings tomorrow. Uh, but at this point, I have to hand it over back to Mark. I want to thank all my distinguished guests. Uh, very fascinating topic. And thank you so much for your remarks. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Mark. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, panelists. Um, great, great talk. Really glad you could, you could all make it. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to say that we're, we're kind of mystified what's going on with some video, some audio being dropping out. Um, uh, if you look in the chat, you will see the information for calling in. I know it's suboptimal, uh, but uh, that's what I'm doing when I can't hear a, a panelist is I'm uh, I've got my phone. I'm when I can hear them, I turn it turn it down. When I can't, I turn it up. So sorry about that. We don't know what's going on. We've done been doing some re research, but uh, anyway, let's get back on track here. Um, so on to our next our next talk, which is uh, my friend from uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Ms. Lori Newman, who manages NASA's Conjunction Assessment Risk Analysis or CARA program which promotes safety of flight services for NASA's unmanned missions. She is also the agency point of contact for SSA for unmanned missions as part of the agency's enterprise protection program. Lori, over to you. Okay, thanks Mark. And uh, thanks to the Aerospace Corporation for inviting me to be here today. This has been a, a great meeting so far. I'm enjoying the discussion. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Brian. So um, today I was going to give a brief overview of the CARA process, what NASA does for conjunction assessment, and then talk about recent changes in the space environment and how those affect risk assessment and um, some best practices that NASA has put in place. Next, please. So um, CARA has been in place since 2004 um, for NASA conjunction assessment operations, um, but also for research and development. And uh, we provide risk analysis and mitigation for about 70 spacecraft um, for NASA and some of our partners. So um, conjunction assessment is a three-step process. We have orbital safety analysts out at the 18 Space Control Squadron facility at Vandenberg Air Force Base where they maintain the space object catalog. We send um, trajectory data out there for our protected assets. They screen them against the catalog and then provide um, predicted close approach data or screening data to NASA CARA for um, a risk analysis. We do that and then we work with our mission customers to help them to decide which um, events are, are really require mitigation and you know, where they should spend their efforts. So that's um, the process in a nutshell. Next slide, please. So, but over the, the past few years, um, the space environment has been changing drastically. Um, We've seen a large increase in the number of owner operators, what kind of orbital objects there are, um, the number of launches. So that's gone along with operators um, with varying levels of expertise coming into the, the space arena, um, rather than the, the old time days where you just had large government operators um, launching spacecraft. So um, in addition, we've seen a number of large constellations that have um, started to be flown, OneWeb, Starlink, um, for example. And so um, both of those factors uh, cause a number of challenges to come up. One is that sometimes a lot of vehicles are launched on the same launch stack. And so depending on how they're deployed, sometimes it takes up to two weeks to catalog them. And so before they're cataloged, um, the conjunction assessment process doesn't work. There's no way to know where those objects are. Um, also, there's um, been an uptick in autonomous maneuvering, which I'll talk about a little more later, um, and maneuvering without having the ephemeris screens to know um, what effects the maneuver might have on conjunction assessment. And there's really no established community best practices, which um, makes it hard to educate these new space actors as they, they come into this arena and um, be able to provide them with a place to go to learn about what to do. Next slide, please. So, and um, as Steph pointed out in the, the previous panel, um, CubeSats aren't an exception to the rule. Small does not necessarily mean safe. Um, a small satellite can destroy a large satellite in the same way a piece of debris can. Um, so those small satellites have to be tracked in order to prevent collisions but they're harder to track because of their size. Some of them are even below the tracking threshold for the space surveillance network. Um, so uh, many small satellite operators don't um, provide their own ephemeris data. They rely on um, 
two line elements that are provided by the 18th, but those come from space surveillance network tracking. So if you don't have that tracking, you don't have a two line element. Um, and some small satellites do maneuver and um, they have to have those maneuver screened because if not, other space operators won't have any way uh, to know where they are. So in short, even though these satellites are small and less expensive, they still pose the same risk and require the same conjunctions. Next slide, please. So CA screenings determine which objects will have close approaches. Uh, this usually happens several days in advance. There could be many close approaches, but only a few of them actually provide safety concerns. And so having a risk assessment process um, enables operators to determine which close approaches are actually a serious conjunction risk. Um, but in order to do that analysis, you need precision state and covariance data because that's what's needed to compute a probability of collision, which enables a mitigation decision. So therefore, risk assessment is really essential to conjunction assessment. Um, the conjunction data message, which is the, the standard uh, set of data that comes out of the screening process, some people think that those are warnings and that they should take an action every time they receive one. That's not true. They're the data from the process that needs to be analyzed as part of this risk assessment process to determine when action is necessary. Um, some operators use two-line elements to do their conjunction assessment process, but we've learned that um, conjunction assessment relies on a, a probability of collision, which requires a covariance. Two-line elements do not have an associated covariance, and therefore they're not appropriate for use in a CA process. Um, and some people say, oh, well, I, I have a CA process. I get data from the 18th. Well, that's great, and you absolutely should get data from the 18th, um, but that isn't risk assessment. Uh, the 18th charter is to provide screenings, which is step one of the CA process, but it's not the risk assessment piece or step two. So that's really something that the operator has to provide on their own. Next slide, please. So, um, and it's it's really important to have this risk assessment process because you're not only protecting your own space asset, but you're protecting the space environment for everybody else. Um, loss of one CubeSat in a huge constellation may be acceptable from um, performing the mission of the constellation, but it may create a lot of debris, which then cause problems for other spacecraft. Um, and it, even if a small satellite is non-maneuverable, uh, communicating with other operators that do have maneuverable spacecraft and could take action is a best practice. So um, here's a list of existing best practices that are available for space operators. Um, one is the 18th Space has a website, spacetrack.org, and they have list their best practices for um, the support that they provide. Uh, Secure World Foundation has what they call a handbook for new, new actors in space, which is very good. Um, there's best practices for um, wider satellite operations, not just conjunction assessment that are available from spacesafety.org. Uh, Confers has a set of published best practices for proximity operations. And in December, NASA finally released um, our set of best practices from our past experience. Um, and I'll talk about a few of the key points from that uh, in the next few slides. Next, please. So the first is don't use two-line elements. I mentioned this a bit um, because they don't have covariance information. But in addition, if you pull the two-line element catalog from spacetrack.org and use that as your source of um, screening data for conjunction assessment, you're actually missing a large part of the full catalog um, because um, that they're not those objects are not all included in the two-line element catalog. Also, the accuracy is only on the order of one to two kilometers um, over a few days, which is not sufficient for conjunction assessment. The 18th has a statement to that effect that's posted on their site. I've listed the link here. There are things that two-line elements are very helpful for, um, such as providing acquisition data or telling about whether other spacecraft are maneuverable, but they're really not appropriate for conjunction. Next slide, please. Uh, it didn't hang on my end. Okay. Next. It went backwards and then it came forward. Okay. Uh, nope, that's still the same one. Okay. 
Okay, there we go, thanks. So um, it's important to have a robust risk assessment process um, to be able to compute the probability of collision using accurate ephemeris and covariance data. Um, also defining the size of the protected asset because that's also an input to the probability of collision calculation. Um, it's important to send ephemerides to 18th space for screening, um, especially if you have a maneuverable payload because that's the only way for other on-orbit operators to know where you're planning to be and to be able to avoid you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and um, trackability, this has been touched on several times this afternoon. Um, basically, the space surveillance network is used and they um, can only track things that are larger than 10 centimeters. Um, and that's what puts an object into the catalog. So um, those are the only things that conjunction assessment can be um, performed with. So it's important for objects to be trackable. So um, that can either be done by ensuring your object is the appropriate size, um, or there's a number of uh, workarounds listed below here. Um, maybe use active tracking, uh, laser reflectors are an option, or you could provide owner operator ephemeris data to the 18th um, to help them out. And this is important for on orbit in addition to um, at injection, making sure that the deployment method is such that the objects are spaced out far enough apart so that the um, objects can be discreetly tracked as early as possible so that they can be included in a conjunction assessment process. Next slide, please. And so um, those are just a, a handful of the things that are listed in the NASA best practices, but I provided a bunch of points of contact here and, and links that you can go to to read the rest of the document and see um, what policies NASA has uh, assessed, levied on our own missions um, to follow these best practices. Um, and so that's all I had today. Thank you. Well, Lori, thank you very much for that. Uh, I can see that this juggling between phones and computers is going to be a little tricky. Uh, there are probably some questions for you in the chat function. Please look, scroll back and see what you can see um, and uh, reach out to Andrew if there are any that, uh, that I've missed. Um, if that, if that being the case, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, hold on here. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Dan Altraga, who is the director of AGI Center for Space Standards and Innovation. Uh, Dan led the formation of and serve as, as administrator for the Space Safety Coalition. We've known each other for a long time, and Dan also does a lot of work at ISO. So, uh, Dan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I also want to express my appreciation for in inviting uh, me to participate here. This is great stuff. It's stuff that I've been working on for, for decades, and, and that just speaks in, to me in terms of the importance of it all. Hopefully, you're seeing my slides now. You can confirm. Um, I, I wanted to. Where, where are Dan's slides? Do you, are you seeing them on screen? No. Okay. Let me try Another once coming. more. Another coming. Excellent. Here we are. Yeah, I wanted. There are many different aspects to CubeSat flight safety, CubeSat operations. I wanted to address. A colleague of mine told me some time ago, though, that um, basically you need to hone it in on three major points because people can't remember a whole lot more than that. So guess what? I have three major points here. Um, the first one is, is hearkening to what people have already been talking about, both in the government uh, panel and, uh, and then also in, in Lori's comments, there was a heavy dose of the need to exchange data. We need this now more than ever. I'll explain why in a bit. We also need to get going on comprehensive data fusion of the data that is, that's exchanged, again, now more than ever. And then thirdly, I just wanted to talk about the kind of the mission planning and launch and early orbit phase uh, parts of CubeSat missions. So launch and early orbit phase is LEOP, if you haven't heard that acronym previously. Now, in terms of, um, <laughs> 
data exchange. This is something that has been really harped on by the IEDC, by the UN, by ISO, by the Space Safety Coalition that we manage. Um, this is critical, I think, to, to bring data together. If you think about what passive uh, tracking systems are able to do, the non-cooperative ones, basically they're getting observations that are historical. Um, and they use those and some very good smart algorithms to extrapolate those forward. We call that in the biz, we call it uh, orbit propagation, but, but really it's an extrapolation. Kepler helps us and force models help us with different gravity fields. But ultimately, there are aspects that one would want to predict and incorporate into such predictions, including drag, which relates to vehicle attitude and maneuvers and space weather that really need data exchange to make them work. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see a bit of a shift, I think, in, in at least some operators thinking that we've been, uh, we've been getting satellite ephemerides and maneuver plans uh, provided by some operators through the Space Data Association, for example, for 10 years now. This has been really helpful. But ultimately, the recognition is to get at the covariance that Lori Newman just mentioned that's required to get collision probability, to get authoritative um, object sizes and dimensions and attitudes so that we can get collision probability estimates. We need to do more than just satellite eph ephemeris and maneuver plans. We could even go so far, and I strongly suggest we do, to process raw measurements from not only the government and commercial SSA tracking providers, but also from the operators. Now, in terms of sharing all this data that I'm, I'm suggesting we share, um, CCSDS is the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems. And this is, uh, they have messages for uh, sharing data like orbit data, conjunction data, tracking data. These are well-established and already in heavy use. So it's not like we have to start from scratch. Um, they are, evolving and, and being enhanced. So I think you'll see that they are going to greatly improve with time. Now, why this, this strong emphasis on data exchange and fusion right now? We were invited by uh, Space News uh, recently to do a characterization of our Socrates um, Conjunction Assessment Service and the Space Data Association data spanning uh, uh, previous years. Socrates actually goes back to 2005. And what we found was a, a bit alarming is that, you know, we've had these events, the Chinese ASAT intercept, Iridium Cosmos collision, those have caused the rate of LEO conjunctions to take a little step function. But apart from that, it's been largely quiescent until about 2017. In, in which time we have doubled actually the conjunction rate. This is pretty dramatic. And, and for those people that, that say, heck, we've been operating in space for decades now, why do we need to do anything different? This is the reason, you know, if you put flat lines, uh, linear fits to these very crude, you can see, you know, we're in a new era right now and we need to treat it as such. Um, now I've, I apologize if you've already seen this video, but this just shows kind of some of the large constellations that we see coming up. And it's really unclear how many are actually going to get their funding and approvals to fly. But, uh, you know, it is a dramatic increase here. And I'm not going to play the whole video. Now, here's a, a boring engineering plot, but it just maybe serves the purpose that. If we look at all the applications, which is the blue dotted line, in terms of what's been applied for, and then maybe we'd say, yeah, but only 10% of those are gonna be realized. And that's the orange dotted line. You know, How are we doing on that trend? Because this is over the next 10 years, we really don't know. Well, we're somewhere in between right now. So again, things are changing. So, 
Uh, now on to data fusion. I've talked about data exchange, but I want to talk about data fusion. We completed a very rapid demonstration of comprehensive data fusion for 17 spacecraft as shown on the right in this chart. And 14 entities, uh, government, commercial, SSA, and also satellite operators participated and contributed their data. Something we did unique here was to actually ask, uh, well, look into what are the requirements for the accuracy of SSA products? And we just picked one example. A lot of people use a collision probability of 10 to the minus fourth. Um, we found some pretty surprisingly tight tolerances on accuracy of, for LEO, about 50 meters, and in GEO, just over 200. So our findings of this demonstration we did, and I'll show you a sample in a moment, is that by doing comprehensive data fusion, we were able to get a two and a half to 10 times accuracy improvement over other products. But even then, it was a challenge to meet these tight accuracy tolerances listed there. This is one of the charts from that demonstration. And you can see this is a lot of statistical cooking on, on a, what I'll freely admit is, is a bit rarefied statistics because we only had 17 spacecraft. But you can get a feel maybe for the different products with TLEs in white and SP is in uh, orange, and then the operator data is in uh, purple, and navigation solutions and the fuse solutions are in blue and green, respectively. Okay, um, now let's talk about mission planning and LEOP phase. These are uh, critical parts to the, the, the mission. Uh, if we look at mission planning itself, um, there's a lot of norms from IDC and UN, LTS and ISO and industry guidelines, which say we need to minimize our post-mission lifetime, hopefully much less than mandated 25 years, but uh, at a minimum that, and also minimize collision risk. Um, testing is critical. We need to make sure that the, the things we're putting in space are well tested and we have assured success that they'll work. And then on the LEOP phase, uh, we need to utilize all the SSA resources and portals at your disposal. Uh, I strongly recommend SSA data sharing agreements with the US government that gets you access not only to TLEs, but the SP data. You consider space data portals like uh, CSSI's Celeste Track, which has supplemental TLEs for new launches, and then also commercial SSA providers such as the ComSpot. I'm gonna kind of fly through this chart. The, the point of this chart is that there are many elements and, and links to the overall chain of getting good SSA that gets us to safety of flight. And to, to have good SSA means that all these links have to be working. I'll just say that right now, I don't think they are. We need to take steps to, uh, to make that better. This is some pictures from the NEAT uh, tool. This stands for Number of Encounters Analysis Tool. It's freely available online. But if you're wondering what your collision risk is, you can go here with your proposed constellation or CubeSat uh, pairings and, and see what it looks like. This chart on the bottom here is, is a video actually of um, conjunction rate, less than five kilometers. The point is to show that even if you're tied and wed to a certain altitude, like some missions are, you can pick inclination that will help minimize your chance of conjuncting with other operators. Now, just as I showed the STCM demo earlier, I also wanted to explore as part of that demonstration, hey, what happens in the, the launch and early orbit phase um, in terms of accuracy of data? And this uh, animation down here, we show similar plots to the STCM demo previous plots. But in this case, we, we show two line element sets after the planet uh, launch from August 18th of last year. And then we show that our requirement is the red line at the bottom, if you can see that. I apologize, it's so small here. And then in orange, we show the uh, accuracy of the SP data 
and you ask why are these diving off of the, the true orbit? Well, it's because of maneuvers and maneuvers happen all the time with a new launch, of course. Uh, we also add here operator and, and uh, NAVSOL fuse data and those are, are quite accurate. So they help, but they are still susceptible to maneuver miscalibration, et cetera. Um, this chart is just something from analysis at the early part of last year, where we looked at all these large constellations and the threat of collision and, and close approach. And I just wanna highlight the millions of close approaches and warnings we get. And the 18th has certainly seen that. NASA uh, CARA office has certainly seen that, that we're, we're having a lot more conjunctions than before. Now, relevant to CubeSats, you might ask the question, well, how, how big is the collision risk for CubeSats? This is from a paper we did in 2017, and, and you're looking at the spatial density, how many objects per meter cubed versus altitude and latitude, and then the size of these bubbles says what their risk is. And these tiny dots are CubeSats. Their collision risk is very small. Um, that, and it's, it's driven actually by the size of the other object they're conjuncting, not their size. The issue is that even though their collision risk is small, the chance that they will impinge on another operator and that they'll have close approaches to within three kilometers and therefore conjunction data messages will be created and oper operators will have to sort through them to find out the real collision risk. Those things are the same, whether you're a big, big operator or a big satellite or not. So in terms of what's different, CubeSats are typically smaller, cheaper to produce, launch and operate. And they may be able to use the FCC's newer streamlined application process. But just to highlight something that um, Lori said, while they may be inexpensive to produce and launch and operate that satellite, Collision avoidance and SSA are, are not any cheaper. Uh, in fact, sometimes smaller satellites are, are more difficult to track. So um, they may be uh, more expensive to do that in a, in a good manner. Uh, and then still, it doesn't matter how big you are. It's still, we still need to emphasize pre-launch and interoperator uh, coordination and data exchange. Um, Actually, for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip that one. And um, just say that, you know, if you consider CubeSat deployments, there's, there's an overall multi-objective function you're trying to maximize. You're trying to maximize them from hitting each other. You're trying to make them trackable. You're trying to uh, have a, a big in-plane in separation rate potentially. Uh, not have some CubeSats have a lot lower lifetime than others. And uh, also you wanna maximize that lifetime while at the same time minimizing probability of collision and the potentially, pot potential to adversely impact other space operators, particularly human space flight. And only now I think we're finally getting into right away rules of the road that, that some mentioned this morning. So let's look just briefly at deployment scenarios. What, you know, there's two scenarios here. The one on the left sends out clusters of, of CubeSats all at the same time. And the one at the right has trusting during the deployment. Which one do you think from a trackability standpoint is better? And which one is better from a prevention of future collisions? Um, I'll, I'll let the left one go to right about there. <laughs> So, you know, we really need to think about how we're deploying these objects by using a little thrust during deployment that maximizes the separation and allows tracking entities uh, to potentially tag and associate them in a better way. So in conclusion, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too long. Uh, we need to focus on data exchange, data fusion, and then in particular, I think, look at the mission planning and, and LEOP phases for CubeSats. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dan. That was an interesting talk. Um, in order we can have some uh, time for the break, uh, I would ask everyone to ask 
questions in the chat function of you and you can answer them there. Um, as I said, we're gonna be on break now until about five of the hour and then we'll resume with the Space Force panel. So uh, until then, I will, we will see you back in a little bit less than 15 minutes. Thank you.
Well, hello, everybody. I see that uh, we are at the five minutes before the hour and the break is over and we can commence with the, the second half of the Virginian. Um, now we're gonna have a, a, a good panel. We're calling it the Space Force panel uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, these are the folks that uh, are basically at the, the pointy end of the telescope, as I like to say. Um, and in order to do that, let me, uh, let me introduce our next panel chair. <clears throat> So our next chair is, is uh, my colleague here at Aerospace, Dr. Joseph Gangestead, who's a senior project leader in the astrodynamics department. He joined Aerospace about 10 years ago, served as the navigation and mission design lead for Aerospace's CubeSat program and later supported uh, Space and Missile Command Special Programs Director, leading many efforts in architecture, architecture analysis and modeling and simulation for space domain awareness. And he is also the first person I know to actually be on something I remember from the before time, um, it's called the business trip. Some of you may remember those back uh, back when we used to have them. Um, anyway, Joe, over to you. Oh, great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that intro, Mark. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and really glad to have everybody joining us today for this panel. Um, we have three very interesting, very exciting people who we're gonna hear from today. And we're gonna start with uh, some, some introductions and opening remarks and then we'll on to uh, some uh, questions either coming from me in conversation among us or hopefully maybe some questions uh, Joe, yeah. um, we're having a different issue with the audio. I, I think we can hear you over Zoom, but if you could speak into the microphone um, you're, or turn it up. Thank you. Turn it up. Okay. Um, I'll try to speak more loudly. Is that working better? A little bit? Okay. Um, oh, you're muted. Um, let me, uh, oh dear. Oops. let me see if I can, um, one second then what I'll, what I'll do is, um, very quickly call in here. Well, that's very embarrassing. Sorry, everyone. Thank you for dialing in, Joe. Uh, I, I could verify that we could hear you um, earlier when you did a test, uh, but I tell you what, if this doesn't work, just carry on. Try it one more time. No, I cannot. Why don't you go back to computer audio? Um, the audience is saying when you lean in towards the computer, they can hear you. Okay, I'm gonna lean in. I'm gonna lean in. Yes, that yes, works. That works? Okay, this might look a little silly, but we'll carry on. I'm sorry, everyone, my apologies. <clears throat> so, all right, well, let's start with our first first panelist joining us. Um, we're gonna start with uh, with Stacy Williams. Uh, Stacy uh, joined DARPA in February of 2019 uh, as a program manager in the Technical Technology Office, where she manages several CubeSat development programs. Uh, her expertise includes sensor development for space situational awareness. Um, previously, she was a program officer at the Air Force Office of Scientific Research in Arlington, Virginia, where she managed the Air Force's basic research investment in remote sensing, 
basic research investment in remote sensing with applications to battlefield monitoring and range and space situational awareness. Prior to that, she served as the technical advisor for space surveillance systems at the Air Force Research Laboratory Directorate Energy Directorate uh, in Maui. So I'm going to uh, push the slides here. Uh, Stacy, thank you for joining us. Yep, thank yep, you very much. You bring these up. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Um, as Admiral Haney nicely highlighted, um, humankind benefits greatly from space technology, and space is now an in indispensable part of our public infrastructure. And um, space assets provide such a great advantage uh, that we have a trend moving towards um, proliferation of satellites, as um, Dan discussed um, previously. And so we're getting away from these single, um, very, very expensive, exquisite systems. And for economic reasons, um, looking at lower cost, small satellites. Um, and, and we see those in a lot of the architecture for agencies like the Space Development Agency and others. Um, <clears throat> so the um, technology has really lowered the cost of these systems um, and, and, and um, enabled greater risk taking um, in space-based research. And DARPA is an active participant in this risk taking. Um, and we have several uh, small satellite demonstrations and um, we're really pushing towards um, enabling higher functionality um, in smaller packages and in, um, more economical. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we experience in, in these uh, technical developments that are related to the topics that we're discussing today. And I'm gonna do that using the um, MEMS deformable mirror CubeSat demonstration, um, also called DEMI. Um, Aurora Flight Sciences and MIT are the performers on that. And if you go to the next chart, You'll see this is a snapshot. So there's the artist rendering of the, of the Demi CubeSat. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the technical details because um, that's not the focus of today. But um, it's a 6U CubeSat <clears throat> um, and is a Pathfinder demonstration for using MEMS deformable mirror um, in space. And the, the benefits of this is it really improves imagery. Uh, for example, if you have a dim object next to a bright object, a um, deformable mirror will help you identify that rather than just a basic standard um, imaging type telescope. Um, and so during the course of the DEMI program, we've experienced several challenges that are relevant here. Um, oh, and actually, let's go to the next chart, sorry, because this is my favorite. Um, so the, the bottom right shows the DEMI satellite when it was being deployed. So uh, DEMI was, the build was completed in December of 2019. It was launched out of Wallops in February, 2020, and then deployed out of the shoot there on, um, um, on the ISS. And currently the system is behind schedule uh, and it is undergoing a test and checkout. Um, and so we were hoping to begin operations um, at the beginning of this year, but we were a little bit delayed. And, um, and so I'll start by talking about the challenges the first significant challenge was obtaining our radio frequency allocation. That's a very onerous process. Um, and you know, we helped our performers with that and DARPA has a lot an infrastructure to help us with that. And it was still significantly challenging. I can't imagine what it's like for a small business or a university, particularly a small university to go through that process, which I think causes a lot of problems. Um, once DEMI was deployed, it took us about two weeks before we could make the initial contact. Now looking at, at Mark Skinner's slide on that, that's actually pretty fast by CubeSat standards. And the, 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 um, you, you, know, the, you have to first identify where it is so that you can make contact with it. And um, originally we were only communicating with DEMI from um, a ground station at Wallops, the NASA Wallops site. And so that really limited that. Um, <clears throat> we were fortunate because we have a lot of connections with the government and we talked with the ComSpoc and also MIT Lincoln Lab. So we were able to get accurate location information and within two weeks to, to talk, you know, to discuss, you know, with that. 
Um, however, the Wallops ground site went down and so put us behind schedule. MIT constructed a ground site on campus, but it doesn't have the bandwidth that the Wallop site has. And so we are, haven't been able to you know, send up a lot of the, um, the, the, um, the, the software changes to the system because of that. And so like, as I mentioned, we're still in checkout. And um, once Demi completes its end of life, we will, um, it'll, it'll be debris, right? And so for us, we did an analysis and um, two years from the deployment of the ISS, we expect it to, um, to, um, to deorbit and no longer be a piece of degree, but until then it still is. And so, um, so these are the, the challenges that I think um, highlight a number of the opportunities where we can improve in the CubeSat arena. And I know those are some of the things that we're gonna to discuss today. Excellent, thank you very much, Stacey. Our, um, our, our second panelist is uh, Cynthia Wilson. Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia has a, a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and a master's in engineering physics um, and has worked at several aerospace organizations over the years. Um, she has been in the 18 Space Control Squadron's SSA Partnership and Coalition Engagement Office for the last few years, arriving at just about the time that the small sat population mushroomed. Uh, Cynthia has expanded uh, the 18th outreach to small satellite owners. I can certainly attest to that, uh, having interacted with her on a number of occasions. Uh, and created procedures to work with all the satellite owners globally in order to have a name and a person to go with each satellite uh, in the interest of spaceflight safety for all. Thank you for coming, uh, for joining us, Cynthia. Hey there, I'm happy to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, I, as you said, I'm Cynthia from 18th Space. It's a SSA Partnership and Coalition Engagement or Space Office. Um, I focus mainly on customer relations for say, space flight safety and data sharing. And we'll be talking about how we talk, track and identify those small satellites that you've all been wondering about. But uh, I do need to note that the views I'm presenting are my own, do not necessarily represent the views of the DOD or its components, gotta make the lawyers happy. Uh, to provide a bit of background, if there's anybody who doesn't know, 18th is the US Space Force Squadron responsible for providing what my bosses call foundational space domain awareness to the, S to the DOD as well as interagency and global partners. Using the US Space Surveillance Network, we track all artificial objects in, in Earth orbit from launch to reentry, and we share the majority of our data through our website, spacetrack.org. Our launch and early orbit determination process includes three main parts, tracking, cataloging, and identifying. Upon launch, we track all associated objects. And once we collect enough data, we catalog each as unique objects and assign them a number in the satellite catalog. From there, we identify each satellite by giving it a common name in the catalog. But as the launches have become more complex, of course, this last step has become more challenging. I'm going to the next slide, please. I'd just like to give you an example. This is the SSOA launch in 2018. There were 65 objects deployed and we're tracking all of them extremely well. But despite our having positive contact with each and every one of the satellite owners, there are still 12 objects in the catalog that don't have a name. We know that a few of the owners never made contacts with their satellite and so they can't identify them, but some of their owners just never told us. Since no one has any obligation to give us any information, we're just grateful for whatever we do get. This is a good illustration of what the data looks like to us. We don't get telemetry or beacon signals, so we rely on our metric observations to allow us to main maintain persistent custody of the objects. But of course, they don't come with name tags. This doesn't tell us what the identities of all the objects are. We do start to get tracking data shortly after the launch, and we initially cataloged the objects just generically as object A, object B, and so on. Then we work with the satellite owners and operators directly to help us give each object the correct satellite name. Now they can use their own resources to figure this out, or they can try out the TLEs from the satellite catalog to see which one gives them the best signal. The identification process requires close coordination with the owners, and it can take days to months. Based on radar cross-section data, we can use spacecraft side a little bit, the size a little bit to, to aid in identification, 
but even when we do have an R average RCS value, it doesn't help if there are like 12 three unit CubeSats on the lot. Once we start getting identifications from the owners, it's really a judgment call on our part as to when to accept them. We take into account the number of objects on the launch, how close they are still together, but we also consider the experience and resources of the particular owner. And if Planet, for instance, has done this hundred times and they're really good at this, we'll accept their ID pretty early on. If it's a high school with their first CubeSat, we give them a little more time. Okay, next slide. Um, things that help us, of course, we would like the owners to have an independent means of verifying the satellite, GPS, or whatever. We would like them to consider trackability ahead of time. The 18th space is not authorized to perform trackability analyses, and we can't respond to requests for assessments. But our general guidelines for confidence in trackability is that the object should be at least 10 centimeter cubed in LEO, it's softball or your classic 1U. 50 cubic centimeters in geo, like basketball to beach ball size. And if they're not sure, we highly encourage the use of a proven detectability enhancement device. We would um, like to get the launch providers predicted an actual orbit and deploy schedule. That helps us a lot for planning and tracking. Uh, we would like it, any on orbit deployers or orbital transfer vehicles. We, Appreciate it if they could wait until their deployers catalog before they start throwing out more objects, which is not always possible. But, and then of course, we'd like to work with everyone. We actively seek out new satellite owners and we work closely with as many of them as we can get a hold of. We have a satellite registration form on SpaceTrack. It's very easy to get everything set up and communications going. We're also trying to find and work with new launch providers. Um, just as an ending note, for the satellites that we haven't had contact with the owners or never found out, we are now starting to use other resources such as websites that you probably know the names of. Uh, Kyra Miles is leading this effort for us and she is hoping to go back and fill in some gaps in the catalog. And that's it for me. That's really good. Thank you for me. Um, <clears throat> our third panelist today is, uh, is Barbara Gall. Uh, Barbara is uh, a trainer for the Joint Task Force Space Defense and the Na uh, National Space Defense Center, and she's the lead white cell controller for the Sprint Advanced Concept Training, uh, which is the latest version of operations experimentation for the, the Space Force's Protect and Defend mission. <clears throat> her, her role with uh, coordinating nanosatellites and their operators has been focused on the cooperative use of on-orbit assets to develop space domain awareness tactics, techniques, and procedures for iterative incremental improvements in operations and training in the spirit of fail fast to improve. Barbara, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so as Joe mentioned, our, our primary interactions in Joint Task Force Space Defense are not to interfere with 18 Space Control's mission. So uh, they have the, the small sat catalog mission. Uh, and so we're very glad to have them because that's a horrible spot to be stuck in. Um, our primary actions with small sets have been in our live experimentation. Um, we've been focused on cooperative activities where we use on-orbit satellites uh, to test the capabilities of our sensors and our operators and force our, uh, ourselves to improve. We've been working with, uh, we, I don't need any slides, Joe, you can drop the slides if you'd like. Uh, we've been working with the Aerospace AeroCube team uh, since as far back as 2015. We've also collaborated with uh, other small sat uh, institutions like the Air Force Academy, the University of Toronto, University of New South Wales, so foreign and domestic partners, as well as commercial groups like Maxar and Iridium with their on-orbit assets. So using um, kind of collaborative um, activities uh, to test and improve has been extremely beneficial for us. Um, these teams has helped, have helped us learn how to interact uh, and, and use what's up there already. So we practice our live operations with a, I don't know how else to call it, but a land of misfit toys. Um, they've taught us to be flexible in leveraging what owner operators are already doing. They're pre-planned upcoming activities. We try to be on our toes to leverage and take advantage of those events by putting no burden whatsoever on the satellite owner operators. Since we didn't buy the spacecraft, 
Uh, we use um, pre-planned routine activities like maneuver series. We use non-routine activities like deorbits. Um, we, we can use unhealthy spacecraft as well uh, to try and again, use every part of the cow um, as we improve uh, our operations. What's the value here for small sat providers is that uh, as we are using these types of assets for practices and, and training events, you have every part of the military network that we can touch now focused on you uh, during areas where uh, if you have critical on orbit activities like deployments or, and maneuvers, if you're part of a training event, we're all watching. So you can get your updates pretty quickly uh, at that point. We also, this also helps provide a better understanding of the capabilities that are being presented by various SSA providers. And so you get a real world look at this is what they can do right now uh, to support you. For us on our side, the value is that we can't train our units um, very easily for on-orbit operations. This is not like the air world. We can't shut down entire sections of the SSA network in order to train the interactions between units. Um, we don't have anything like Nellis uh, in order to make something work uh, and practice things out. So much of what we do, we have to do live on orbit concurrent with real world missions. So uh, this has been extremely helpful to be able to do collaborative cooperative practice with the general community, use the on orbit configurations they already plan to do, and then use that to uh, improve ourselves and our performance. Any questions there? Well, I've got so many questions, and I'm actually going to I'm going to start. I uh, thank you all, um, and we've got some 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 questions uh, coming in through the chat. But I want to ask my question first. It has been on my mind a little bit, and this goes. I think this goes to all three of you. So meanwhile, I'm hoping we can hit all three of you. If if you can, we can speak briefly in the short time we have. Um, there's all, all of you talked about. Um, largely the, the coordination challenges involved in, in doing space, uh, space safety of flight well. Whereas a lot of the conversation is sometimes focused on technology. And I'm curious to get your perspectives on where do you think the low hanging fruit is for safety of flight? Is it, is it in the technology? Is it you know, flying a transponder or every, on every satellite? Or is the low hanging, the low -hanging fruit um, you know, just better coordination either with with better uh, collaboration tools or better, um, you know, better chat or something like that. What What do you think? Let's maybe start with uh, with Stacy. Um, <clears throat> sure. So, I, you know, I, I was thinking about that question when when you sent it out in advance, and and I do think actually that coordination is one of the biggest challenges that we we always have. It's very different. Mm. All these different groups that are separated, and there's not a lot of clue cross collaboration. Um, but I do think that, that we need to focus on that and particularly developing some kind of, of international collaboration that, that's actually uh, mission focused, so not process focused, but really looking at, all, at this entire community and trying to identify um, ways to help them and ways to, to make us um, or to enable us to be able to do this, you know, the safe flight, to, to be able to track, to be able to um, you know, get, get the licenses to not, um, you know, you, you know, make sure that we're, that we're not getting out of our bands mm -hmm. and, and also a, a user friendly way to navigate all the regulations, um, particularly once they become, um, codified into law. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, B B Barbara, what do you think? If you don't mind, I was actually going to defer to 18 Space Control oh. <laughs> because they are the safety of flight mission and I don't want the JTF contract. Okay, them, so. fair enough, understood, Cynthia. Okay, keep in mind that we're not allowed to tell people what to do or really give recommendations. Just what I said, please think about trackability ahead of time. Don't just mm. throw it up there and expect us to find it for you without help. Um, and then listen to what everybody else said. There are a lot of things out there that talk about safety of flight. Uh, the other thing we'd like is just talk to us. That's, right. that's a begging. So let me let me follow up with that on a question that came up in chat. Um, it's something that I've, I've encountered myself, which is um, who can or should determine 
the, the trackability. It, it's undeniably uh, a critical element. We've heard about it throughout today. Um, but who, who, who could a, a new organization turn to um, to, to verify this, uh, this sort of information? But that's, that's certainly needed for safety of flight. Well, again, unfortunately, we can't do it. It's a little frustrating, mm. but there are good reasons for it. Um, we would just refer them to anybody that has a trackability enhancement device. Let them talk to those. And there are a number of those out there. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as if another agency should take it on, I'd have to leave that to other people too. Okay. Um, another question that I had, um, which is maybe maybe something uh, Barbara could comment on. Again, getting back to this this question of um, the the coordination and organization. Uh, I know Barbara that you have worked a lot hurting hurting large numbers of cats on both the, the owner operator side and on the sensor side. Um, what, I guess my question is somewhat twofold is, you know, what are some of the lessons learned you've gotten from doing that? And as we think about uh, space traffic management moving into the civil domain, um, do, do you think that there are any gotchas out there that maybe haven't been part of the conversation yet that, that the civil community should be keeping an eye on? Uh, yes. So, um, God bless Department of Commerce. Uh, they've got a they've got a bear in front of them. Um, so the first piece is, and I think someone put it in chat. Someone said something like, "We need to stop the we launch it, you find it" thing. Um, this we have to be leveraging cooperative data. Um, so how do how do we leverage cooperative data? It better not be via email. Like, how do we make this machine to machine? Make this very uh, easy for us. SDA has been leading the charge on this. So we have a variety of different places where we can learn the lessons um, to make this machine to machine enabled for using cooperative data. So that's one. Uh, I think another one, I think I heard it from um, uh, Lori Newman with NASA. It's not just the current stuff. It's also the projected stuff. Where are you going? How will you be maneuvering so that we are uh, projecting into the future? Uh, and accounting for where you plan to go. Uh, mm. And so that's another piece. Uh, another part is, um, you know, don't undercut the market. Um, how do we make sure that we are uh, helping grow um, a, a commercial market for this? Um, and so that, that's another piece. Uh, what is what's required for safety and what is damaging to our partners uh, in the commercial environment? Um, so those, those are kind of uh, some big three that I would toss out there that we, we have to do it or we're not going to help this community uh, grow. Over. Thank you. Thank you. When, um, when my next thought is going towards, uh, back to Stacy as a, so the owner operator uh, on our panel, um, when you were uh, starting to develop DEMI and, and some of the other programs you were working on, at what stage um, were you really starting to incorporate the, the safety of flight uh, challenges? You, you mentioned uh, that you know, it's, it took actually a couple of weeks to get in touch with Demi after it was deployed. Um, did you, Stacey, did you, did you learn any lessons about how you might do a new mission in, in light of the challenges you had? Yeah, so um, I, I think the, the idea of putting these um, AIS type transponders on the satellites would be, would be very helpful. Also, I think having um, a network of ground stations, so we're not just relying on, on wallops. And you know, now we've got the mm -hmm. ground station, but, but having a, um, a whole network of ground stations, so we have a lot of opportunities to be able to communicate with the satellites. I think um, you know, th that would definitely help improve the situation. Excellent. Do you, <clears throat> now another, uh, we've got about only, only one minute left, but I'll throw out another broad question and I'll, I'll let whoever wants to speak, uh, speak, but this is a controversial question, but where do you think the balance um, between the, 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 the space domain awareness community and the owner operators lies for safety of flight? How much is it that they should be putting transponders as Stacy brought up? How much should it be the government investing in bigger, better, better sensors, for example? Anyone want to comment? Or I'll, I'll pick you. I'll pick someone. I'll, <laughs> I'll comment and see if I get in trouble with 18th. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so for, for me, it's a mix uh, when I look at it. We're not here to be onerous on folks, but uh, if you're throwing up, you know, two centimeter, three centimeter cube sets, then, then, and no one can see you, would you get away to, with doing that in any other domain with potentially slamming into something where you could make a mess? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a level of, of reasonableness that we need to be looking at. Um, now I will say it doesn't necessarily have to be active. So I've heard active transponders, but you know, when things get tossed off the side of a launch vehicle, um, you know, the thing's not on yet. So it can't be active. Are there passive things that we can do, corner cubes, whatever, um, to help with um, something in a state where it's unpowered um, to help us do that sort of identification? Any cooperative information about what you're doing, what you look like, what size you are. If on our side, we can make that machine a machine, machine and not onerous to you, um, then I think there's, there's, some collab there's more collaboration we can do here um, that isn't a terrible burden on the owner operators um, and still helps us do the, the space traffic management, over. Mm. Cynthia, what do, you, what do you think? Again, we don't have a lot of say, whatever they put up, we have to try and track. Um, <laughs> and the, I do know from personal experience, the little tracking devices can make a difference. Mm. For instance, there is a quarter you out there that has extra things, devices, and we're tracking them just fine. The university put out a quarter you, and we're really not tracking. So it can mm. make all the difference. Right. People just need to be aware this is an issue. I'm not sure this is something they bring up in schools. They talk about all the technical things and can we keep in orbit and not be trash. Did anybody stop to think about can it be tracked? Mm -hmm. I don't know how you get that into it. It does help. It's gotten better over the last few years. We've done more outreach, gone to the conferences. People are now starting to come to us, which is great. We love to hear from everybody. Uh, but I think it's really an awareness thing that this should be part of the boxes that you check off. Excellent. So well, that's, I, uh, I, I think we'll all heartily endorse that recommendation that everyone should be thinking about this, right? From the very beginning. Thank you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, alas, um, we're, we're out of time. Our, uh, we only, we only had 30 minutes and, but I think we got some really great questions in before, before, <laughs> before Mark yanks me off the stage with the candy cane. Does anyone, anyone have any last comments they want to make? No? Okay, well, great. Uh, Barbara, Stacy, Cynthia, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel today. Um, there's been a lot of interesting conversation in the chat, actually. I think some, some interesting things might come of that conversation, but uh, uh, in, in the meantime, uh, take care and, and thank you again. Well, Joe, ladies, thank you very much. A wonderful discussion. Uh, I would encourage you guys to, uh, to listen in tomorrow. Well, you may, you may hear some interesting technical solutions that are coming from industry that you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised to, to hear about. Now let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I've got my good friend, Chris Kunstadter here. Chris is a global head of space at AXA XL. He's got to have the best job title of anybody on this, on this call. Um, AXA XL is a leading provider of space insurance. He's actively involved in all as aspects of AXA XL space activity, including technical, financial, and actuarial analysis, policy construction, claims handling, industry outreach, and business development. Chris, over to you, please. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to the whole team at Aerospace and everyone participating. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we'll get going. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, insurance is, uh, is, a, is an important part of the space economy. And uh, one of the most important things that I'm told all the time is how can you incentivize, how can you incentivize good behavior in space? And, I think my, my, my major response to that is incentivize, you know, how about the future of life in space? To me, that's a big enough incentive. Let's, you know, before we get into things like financial incentives and insurance discounts and all that. So anyway, let me talk today about uh, some of the issues that, that we see in um, space insurance when we're dealing with CubeSats. And I have my, a colleague of mine, Denis Bousquet from our Paris offices on the line also. He and I have been working very closely on, on various um, CubeSat databases, uh, anomaly databases, that sort of thing. So we're, we're really very heavily involved in the, in the CubeSat insurance business. So space insurance uh, covers virtually every technical risk from launch onwards, uh, including the collision risk. And as I, as I 
like to say, you collide, we provide. That if the um, uh, if you, there is a collision and if it's not otherwise excluded in the insurance policy, it is insured. So we have a big stake in this business. We have a big stake in the business of not colliding. Uh, some of the challenges we face, we face a lot of technical and actuarial and other challenges, um, but I'll deal with a couple here. The small satellites, with small satellites, you're dealing with um, very uh, short build times, low redundancy, uh, very little testing. So uh, it, it's not uncommon to have many more failures on orbit on small satellites than on, uh, than on larger satellites. Um, large range of values. Um, we've insured CubeSats with values as low as, I think, $50,000. So when we're providing $50,000 worth of insurance, we need to be able to make enough premium to pay just to keep the lights on and, and, and uh, send out the email confirming our, our risk. At the same time, we may have an, uh, an Ariane launch with two big communication satellites on it that's insured for $800 million. So the range from 50,000 to 800 million is huge, and that has a number of impacts. One is it generates competition. The $800 million launch needs a lot of capital in the market. We provide some of that. Uh, but a $50,000 um, uh, uh, in, uh, insured satellite uh, Basically, there a lot of people fighting over insuring that. So the range of values and small satellites really do affect the way we look at the, the CubeSat risk. We are very, very vocal, encouraging all space actors to act to, uh, to use best practices for safety and sustainability in space. We're, you, many of you have heard me speak at these um, types of events before, and we would like to see all space actors, all space operators use tracking devices, use beacons or what have you. I mean, corner reflectors, as was uh, discussed in the previous panel, it's very important. It really is. I'm going to show you some statistics. Well, first of all, in terms of the, the way we do businesses, we generally insure satellite operators, but we also insure uh, manufacturers, launch service providers, banks, and what have you. So we're very, again, very heavily invested in the entire value chain of the, uh, of the space business. Let's look at some stats now. You know, we've talked about this growth in the number of, of satellites, and it is really very dramatic. So this year we had over 1,250 satellites launched. Obviously, many of them were Starlink, and in fact, without Starlink, we would have had a fairly average year. Um, but, but this is the new normal. This is where we're going to be from now on. So we really have to be ready for that. This isn't going, this isn't just an anomalous year and the rate goes back down to 500 satellites a year. That's not gonna happen. If we look at multi-satellite launches, and there was a lot of discussion about this, a bunch of speakers so far have talked about the, the number of objects that are still not um, identified. They're cataloged and they're tracked, but they're not identified. The owner hasn't been identified. Well, if you look at the growth in the number of launches with large numbers of payloads on them, it is very dramatic. And in fact, this year we're forecasting over two dozen launches with more than 60 satellite or 60 or more satellites each. One of the launches coming up very soon here has 143 payloads, 143 payloads. Everything from one and a half U CubeSats on up to, um, to some pretty hefty uh, uh, satellites, uh, 200 kilogram satellites. So this isn't a, a problem that's going away. It's going to get more difficult. So in terms of the number of, uh, of, of things that we insure in space, we insure almost half of the launches to orbit. We insure more than two thirds of the satellites that are launched. Uh, for satellites under 150 kilograms, we insure over 50% of those. Um, 100 of those 1,200 satellites are still not correlated with their owners. And this is a problem, as, as the, the previous panel just discussed. You know, who's, whose responsibility is it? Nobody wants to be bumping into someone else's satellite. We certainly don't want it to happen because we're we've got insurance on it. Uh, in terms of CubeSats, uh, again, well over half of the CubeSats launched uh, were insured, have been insured during launch. So Insurance plays a very, very uh, important role in the space economy. <clears throat> if we look at CubeSats, since that's the topic of uh, today's discussions, um, this is some data from a professor at St. Louis University um, who tracks uh, CubeSats. 
Um, I am, uh, you know, as a proxy for any other data, I'm going to use his data. He tracks uh, um, almost 1,200 CubeSats that have been launched uh, and, and why they failed, if they failed. So what I did is I, um, I wanted to see what the failure rate would be. So I made a few assumptions. I said, okay, partial mission achieved, let's say that's a 50% success. Unknown outcome, let's say they're fully successful. And let's say that the average lifetime of these CubeSats is one year. Well, you get a uh, failure rate of 32.5% using these you know, questionable data, questionable algorithms, questionable assumptions, but nonetheless, it's the best we have. <clears throat> so more than a 30% mission failure rate. Uh, mission meaning it could have been the ground, it could have been just not being able to find it. Mm, okay, there's your problem. Um, by comparison, geosatellites have a, an annual failure rate of less than 2%, and that includes the first two months of operation where failure rates are up in the 3 or 4% range. So um, this, is, this is a dramatic number. Uh, if 30% if of those uh, CubeSats are failing before the end of their mission life, this is something that is going to impact the number of objects that are up there that are uncontrollable and can't be, can't be brought down, but they can be tracked. And putting a beacon on a satellite is very simple. So when it comes to space safety and space sustainability, we have a lot of opinions. Um, we're concerned. Space insurers are concerned. Failures have gone up in the last several years. Premium has gone down because of competition and, and various other market factors. So that results in a lot of volatility and some insurance companies have pulled out of the market. We have a number of new launch vehicles and, we, and it has been demonstrated by the 8.4% uh, 8 launch vehicle failure rate last year around the world that um, early launches of new vehicles have a higher risk of failure. We're seeing more small satellites. I discussed that before. Less redundancy, less testing, higher risk of failure. We're concerned about, um, about collisions. People talk about debris risk. I, I would really much rather have people refer to collision risk. Debris risk, if you're an operator, that's someone else's problem. You don't make debris. You, you have operational satellites. So, but if we discuss it, if we describe it as collision risk, I think we'll all be uh, more attuned to it. <clears throat> Secondly, insurers in general are concerned. As you can imagine, things like COVID and, and uh, hurricanes and the like are, um, are really having a very significant impact on insurance companies in general. Um, global political instability, low interest rates. These are the things that keep those CEOs up at night and therefore they keep us up at night. <clears throat> uh, as a good friend of ours, Darren McKnight uh, says, the same rules that apply in your house apply in space. Don't make a mess, okay? Don't, don't leave stuff up there that shouldn't be up there. Tell people where you are, have some sort of a tracking aid and clean up after yourself. Get out of uh, orbit once you have uh, completed your mission. So the, the best practices that we in the insurance uh, business feel are the most important for space safety and sustainability, tracking devices. We've talked about beacons, we've talked about all sorts of um, tracking aids. It's cheap, it's easy, um, and if, if, if someone says to me, well, who's going to pay for it? Uh, my response again is, we're all going to pay for it if nobody does anything. Secondly, <clears throat> propulsion. There, there are very viable small propulsion modules for even CubeSats, for 2 and 3U CubeSats, that will allow for quick um, collision avoidance and, and PMD. Passivation and post-mission disposal, very important. 25 years, mm, that's a long time, and that's an old rule. That's a 25-year-old rule. Um, let's make it one to five years after the end of mission. It's not hard. It really isn't hard. There are a lot of ways to do that, one of which is active debris removal. So we're very um, encouraging of many of the ADR organizations that are out there, some of whom are on the call today. So the bottom line is for our, our, our views on, on the policy issues, the, the policy, the government policy, the industry best practices, have to adapt to this changing market. The number of objects that we're going to be tracking is going up very quickly, and we need to be ready to, uh, to handle that. And then responsible behavior is the baseline. It's not as if you get a gold star for being a good operator. No, everyone should be a good operator. Everyone should clean up after themselves. 
So responsible behavior is the baseline. It's the least you should do, not the aspiration. So finally, space insurance is very important for the space economy. There wouldn't be a lot of the space economy if we didn't have uh, space insurance, for both for in innovation, you know, people willing to take risks, and for investment in, in large systems. We've suffered increasing losses and decreasing premium over the last several years, again, due to new launch vehicles, changes in technology, competition among insurance companies, low interest rates, all the, the, the market forces that are driving us. <clears throat> we work very closely with industry to foster safety and sustainability in space. Again, my colleague, Denny, who's on the call, he works very closely in the European market. Um, I work very closely with the US organizations and, and companies. We work very closely with industry to make sure that everyone understands what the issues are and what our opinions are, because we do have these very strong opinions. We actively encourage tracking devices for all space operations. The more we make, the cheaper they'll be. You know, we just need to make sure that we can get as many people to use them as possible. Sometimes people say, oh, well, what about the Russians and the Chinese? Will they use them? You know what? If we get 50% buy-in or 70% buy-in, that's a lot better than we have today. <clears throat> we can't afford to just watch and wait. We have to act. <clears throat> Now's the time when we have this groundswell of, of interest in this issue Let's make these choices now. Let's make the choices now to, to, um, to enhance safety and sustainability. And finally, we're focused on profitability as any company should be, but we're also focused on responsibility in space. So thank you very much. Chris, uh, as normal, a very wonderful talk. Thank you very much. I saw that uh, a number of questions have come up in the chat. Uh, if you would uh, please take some time and address those. Absolutely. Uh, I need to move on to the next uh, panel, which will be, I think, very interesting. It's going to be the first of two international panels, one today, and then we'll have another one tomorrow. Um, and I'd like to introduce the panel chair. Panel chair will be Ms. Victoria Sampson, who is the Washington Office Director for Secure World Foundation, who we've done other things in the past with and has over 20 years of experience in military space and security issues. Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. I just wanna make sure, can everyone hear me? Are we good? Yes, okay, great. All right, uh, thank you to you, Mark, and to Aerospace for setting up this opportunity and for the fantastic conversation so far. Um, the reason why I'm so excited about this panel is that you know a near-term focus for space safety is detecting and avoiding collisions between active satellites and other space objects. But technology is not the only part of this. You need to have a broader array of policy and regulatory tools in order to provide oversight and management of these space activities. Although the legal authority for implementing and enforcing this oversight is at the national level, there is a need for international coordination and harmonization of the underlying norms of behavior, best practices, standards, and rules. And so panels like the one we're about to have, an international panel with a diverse amount of viewpoints we don't typically hear in US policy discussions, I think only really enhance the debate and deepen our knowledge and awareness of the issue of space safety and sustainability. So I'm really delighted to have their expertise. Um, please feel free to uh, submit questions to the um, speakers in the chat as we're hoping to have some time after the presentations for discussion. Um, with that, I'm just gonna go down the line, introduce my speakers as they go. Our first panelist is Andrew Johnson, who leads the Space Policy and Regulatory Systems team, which forms the core of the New Zealand Space Agency, housed within their Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment. The Space Agency was established in 2016 and is the front door for space activity in New Zealand, the lead government agency for space policy, regulation, strategic space development, strategic sector development and outreach. Um, Andrew, the forger, and also um, Andrew's having trouble with his connection earlier. I don't know if he's gonna be able to do video or not. So wait and see. Yes, thanks, thanks, uh, Victoria. Can you, can you run hear me okay? We can hear you just fine. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so no apologies for the connection at our end. Um, we seem to be having some trouble with the link. Uh, so we're having to do this via phone. So that's why the, uh, the, um, the video is not going because I think it might be a bit ropey. Um, so apologies for that, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about uh, these issues that are extremely relevant to New Zealand. 
Um, uh, as you indicated, the New Zealand Space Agency um, uh, sees the issue uh, of satellite tracking and IDing as particularly relevant. We are a um, relatively new uh, launch state uh, with the emergence of Rocket Lab, who announced their intention to launch their electron vehicle from New Zealand in 2015, and then from 2018 onwards, uh, have been launching uh, pretty regularly with increased frequency uh, to the point where we've now had nearly 100 small satellites launched from, uh, from, from New Zealand. And these are particularly small satellites, cube satellite, CubeSats. Um, so this is a, a particularly pertinent issue for New Zealand. Um, as a launching state, uh, we obviously have a strong incentive uh, and responsibility to ensure the sustainability of the space environment. And we take sustainability and responsibility uh, very seriously in New Zealand. They're very core values for us. Uh, so we're keen to see a sustainable uh, LEO environment uh, and eventual space traffic management regime um, that upholds those principles. So how does New Zealand play its part? Um, well, for, for the start, we have our, our regulatory regime, our Outer Space and High Altitude Activities Act, uh, which manages space activity from New Zealand through a licensing and permitting system for all activity in space and in high altitude. Uh, our legislation requires anyone who wants to launch a satellite from New Zealand to hold a permit issued by the New Zealand government. Those permits consider a number of things when we're deciding whether to issue a permit, uh, New Zealand's international obligations, uh, aspects of sustainability and responsibility when it comes to our assessment of orbital debris um, mitigation plans, uh, and also whether the particular launch of the, of the satellite in question is in our national interest. Um, this regulatory system is the means by which we comply with the, the UN Outer Space Treaty and the long-term sustainability guidelines um, agreed at COPUS. In addition to our formal uh, legal uh, framework, we also have a number of what we call operational policies um, that we're adding to all the time. Uh, and one of these I think is particularly relevant to the discussion today. Uh, it's our small satellite policy. Um, so we wanted to basically ensure that uh, with New Zealand being a prominent launcher of very small satellites, um, that at a minimum, uh, these satellites are trackable, if not readily identifiable. So to that end, we've issued a guidance document on our website that says for any satellite that is smaller than 1U, we will require evidence that operators of the satellites uh, of that size will provide additional evidence that they are trackable. Uh, that's an outcome-based policy, so we don't do, dictate how people um, comply with that. There, there could be technical solutions like reflectors or beacons, or it could be a uh, uh, interaction with a, um, you, you know, an SSA company that demonstrates that the, the satellite is in fact um, trackable by conventional SSA means. If a satellite is unable to demonstrate that it is trackable, then we may attach conditions to their permit such that they can only operate um, uh, you know, under, under certain altitudes, for example, under 400 kilometres, where, where we would expect there might be crew space, spacecraft. Um, this is a policy that's very much one that will evolve over time as technology develops and the LEO environment becomes more congested. We're certainly considering what other guidance and policy might be necessary and very, very keen to hear what other people on the panel might think. But I guess it's our, our initial take at sitting out what's important to us in terms of, of this debate and how to take things things forward in terms of responsibility in, in, in the LEO environment. I also just want to talk a little bit about our New Zealand Space Agency relationship with uh, the SSA sector. So we're very keen to harness the power of the growing and innovative commercial SSA sector and use that sector to provide solutions that inform our policy and better enable us to implement our regulatory uh, obligations. Uh, so one particularly relevant example is our partnership with the uh, commercial SSA company Vio Labs, who are based in the United States, um, but also uh, uh, have a presence here in New Zealand uh, following a, uh, an agreement in 2018 where we agreed to work together on uh, SSA capabilities that saw uh, Leo Labs uh, site one of their uh, phased array radars here in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and also work with us on the development of a online satellite tracking dashboard uh, for the New Zealand Space Agency. So this dashboard is a tool that allows us to track and monitor uh, each New Zealand launched object, object in real time uh, using, using the Leo Labs radar data. Uh, and that's a really important part of our, our regulatory toolkit, making sure we have track of everything that's launched from New Zealand, um, setting regulatory limits uh, around where objects are relative to what they they, the applicant told us where they would be uh, in, in the permitting in the permitting process. 
Um, and that's something that I think we will continue to develop and evolve with Leo Labs as, as more and more objects are launched from New Zealand uh, and as norms and rules in the international community to develop further. So that, that was initially a pilot project and we're just going through the process now of transitioning that to a full service. Um, in addition to the dashboard project with Leo Labs, um, Leo Labs are also working with one of our universities here in New Zealand, the University of Canterbury, uh, using their data to study uh, the collision risk of New Zealand launched uh, satellites and the resulting potential liability under the UN Liability Convention. Uh, so the results of this study are due to be released uh, early this year, and it's something we're really very excited about um, because it's, I think it's a, a really important stepping stone to further areas of study in SSA, the development of the STM regime more generally, um, informing our policies, um, helping us to identify how we might want to attach other conditions to our, our, our permitting system. So, for example, uh, deciding what liability conditions we might want to attach to um, our permits. Um, and then hopefully also stimulating that's the appetite for that sort of information data in, in the private sector as well. Um, so we, we're really excited about that and, and hope that that seeds fruitful discussions. So just to, just to wrap up um, in terms of where to from here and what's our perspective and what, we, what would we like to see happen. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, some form of satellite ID becoming commonplace and then maybe even routinely required by national regulatory authorities is probably something that New Zealand would support in the, in the medium to long run. Um, we, we definitely see the commercial SSA sector having a major role to play in that, um, offering you know, the cutting edge products and services to government and non-government entities that complement um, the baseline information coming through from Space Track. Um, we want to see launching states more rigorously and consistently uh, improve and apply their uh, registration practices with the UN. Uh, I think, you know, it's probably, it almost goes without saying that, you know, information is really the, the heart of all of this and we, we haven't quite got that right yet. So we, let, let's focus on getting the information uh, as, as full and as transparent as possible. And registration is really quite key in that. Uh, and then the last point would be just to say, we're, we're quite keen to see industry involvement and in the rules and norms of space traffic management become you know, further entrenched um, because we really see industry as a partner in, in making this work rather than, you know, something that governments sit to one side and impose on industry. So, yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity and I'm very happy to take questions in the panel session. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. And just New Zealand has been so forward thinking about this. It's really inspiring. Um, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Poncho Maruping. Poncho is the managing, um, is a deputy managing director at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. She is the current chair of the South African Council for Space Affairs and the former chair of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Science and Technology Subcommittee. Pancho, it's all you. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, I guess I just wanna start by you know, mentioning that you know, keeps, as far as we are concerned, CubeSats are a very important part of our satellite ecosystem. Uh, and I know that it's been mentioned uh, throughout this evening that there's a difficulty to initially track, uh, especially when they are launching batches. Uh, but given the low manufacturing costs, the shorter development cycles, and increased accessibility of launches for um, these satellites, um, we do expect that the rate at which uh, they are put in orbit is, is going to increase. Um, South Africa, as well as many developing countries, has been active in developing and launching CubeSats. Uh, it's become a really affordable way of um, training engineers, developing technology, and providing much needed uh, observation solu solutions for for the country's needs. Um, the South African Space Council, which is a regulatory body for space affairs in South Africa, uh, has been grappling with creating a balance between enabling growth uh, and development of the space sector, uh, while also making sure that uh, the country remains a responsible user of, of space. We are very much aware of the need to preserve the long-term sustainability of outer space. And in fact, we are currently reviewing our, 
and a 27 year old space legislation um, to take into account some of the uh, issues that are being discussed here. Um, perhaps a bit of perspective. Um, so South Africa launches its first CubeSat, the Red Cube uh, One in, in 2013. Since then, a, an additional four CubeSats were launched uh, by South Africa. Uh, during that period, perhaps a handful of African countries, uh, such as Nigeria, Kenya, and Ethiopia, uh, have also launched CubeSats. Um, just in contrast, a total of 80, 84 CubeSats were launched from the International Space Station just in 2013. Uh, so for most developing countries, you know, it's always going to be difficult to contemplate uh, creating more regulations um, given, given the limited size of the industry and the need obviously to, to grow uh, local capabilities. Uh, so as, as a regulator, uh, obviously uh, my focus is around finding more reasonable ways of, of doing this. Uh, while ensuring that uh, the sector um, can be sustained. Um, I would say that uh, if for most regulators, the best place to start uh, would be to consider uh, the 21 guidelines that have been developed by the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And these have also been adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. These guidelines are applicable whether we are taking small, medium, or large satellites. Um, while they are non-binding, they are still developed through a consensus-based discussion, which takes into account the views of established and emerging space actors, private corporations, civil society, and therefore represents a wide range of all those who utilize space and are affected by space activities. I know that it tends to take long for the UN to get uh, to some sort of agreement, uh, but you know the topics that are addressed through these guidelines um, are comprehensive, and due to the unique nature of um, the, or the physics of space, the activities of one space uh, actor can have an effect on many others. The uh, 21 agreed guidelines provide guidance on policy and regulatory frame, framework for space activities. They deal with safety of space of operations, international cooperation, capacity building and awareness, and scientific and technical research and development. Um, the UN therefore um, encourages states and international uh, intergovernmental organizations to voluntarily take measures to ensure that these guidelines are implemented to the greatest extent feasible and practicable. Um, so as far as possible, South Africa is looking at ways to implement these guidelines as proposed. Uh, for example, the first set of guidelines deals with the need for states to adopt, revise, amend, and as necessary, uh, national regulatory frameworks for outer space activities and in doing so to consider the need to ensure uh, and enhance long-term sustainability of outer space activities. Uh, at UN Copias, uh, we are working on establishing a working group to enable ongoing engagement on, on these issues, issues. And a lot of these are actually relevant to um, uh, some of the uh, challenges that have been expressed here. In fact, later this month, I'll be facilitating an informal consultation with uh, the various uh, um, member states uh, to ensure that we can have this working group established. And, and I hope a lot of people uh, who are here um, can participate in some way uh, in ensuring that these guidelines are, are considered and implemented as much as possible. It is my view that it's only really through cooperation on regulations, the sharing of best practice that we can uh, more adequately address the issues. 
Uh, and as I've mentioned, um, for example, if you look at um, section B of the guidelines, which deals with safety uh, of operations, um, a lot of the issues uh, that we've been talking about uh, this afternoon are, are really adequately dealt with from um, ensuring that there's measures uh, that address um, uncalled, uncontrolled re-entry of, of space objects to um, you know, designing and operating of space, uh, space object taking into consideration a trackability of, of the object irrespective of the, the size, um, as well as, um, you know, sharing a, a information a, and best practice a, with all of the space actors to ensure that as far as possible, a, a lot of the states can implement measures that uh, allow for everyone to uh, be able to access and use a space effectively. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks, sorry, I was having trouble getting unmuted. Thank you, Poncho, and really appreciate, you know, the viewpoint of ensuring that when international groups are discussing these guidelines and best practices, that there's not an undue burden placed on emerging space actors. And um, of course, thank you for bringing up the LTS, the Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines. Of course, my organization, the Secure World Foundation is a huge supporter of those guidelines because our executive director, Peter Martinez, was a working group chair that led the discussions. He's written extensively on them on our website. Um, and one of the things that he's pushed and I think has been brought up a lot in the discussions in COPE with is that it's not just enough, as you said, to have these guidelines, but figure out how do you proliferate them and how do you implement them? I think that's relevant to any discussion we have about CubeSats, best practices, you know, identification, whatever agreements are made about that. Um, come up with any agreement you want, but until people actually enact them, they're not super helpful. Thank you again. Okay, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Um, Pieros Papadeas is a board member and director of operations at Libra Space Foundation, where he works on projects such as uh, SatNogs, which is a global network of open source satellite ground stations tracking hundreds of satellites around the world. Pieros, please. Thank you, Victoria, for the introduction. Uh, Mark, I believe um, you have the video that we can, with the slides, right? Hello, my name is Pieros Papadeas. I'm the Director of Operations for Libre Space Foundation. And I'm here with a brief intro about the foundation and our efforts around space situational awareness. Firstly, about the foundation itself, we are a non-profit foundation. We were founded in 2015. We are headquartered out of Athens, Greece, uh, and we have operations in four different countries around the world. We are focused 100% in space, and specifically 100% in open source space technologies. A brief intro to some of our upstream projects. We've been uh, built open hardware uh, CubeSat, the first open hardware CubeSat ever built in the world, uh, a 2U CubeSat that flown uh, almost three years ago, and then um, on more miniaturized technologies like uh, 1P Pocket Cubes, we've developed um, specific affordable open source platforms, which, which we call Cubic, and those are in the format of 1P, uh, one Pocket Cube. Um, and the first ones are going to be flying, uh, if all goes well, in a month from now. And they include a LEO identification experiment, which is relevant to what we're discussing uh, today. And with that, there's also um, a Pico bus and a pocket cube deployer, basically, in order to lower the cost to orbit for this specific platform and other upstream projects that we do, like an S-Man and UHF CubeSatcoms with open hardware um, design and open soft, uh, software, of course. Perhaps more, more importantly and more relevant to uh, today's the panel is our midstream efforts, uh, specifically around um, a global ground station network, which we call SATNOX. Um, SATNOX is um, a network of ground stations around the world. Uh, it provides telemetry and telecommand and control capabilities for different missions that choose to use it. Uh, it includes a modular setup of many different technologies that interlock with each other. 
there is a reference ground station design with antennas and rotator and electronics and software you know related to, to it so that someone can get started easily on it uh, everything that we do on RF side is uh, software defined radio based um, and it provides a complete telemetry solution all the way from reception scheduling reception and all the way to dashboards and operations uh, for specific satellites um, the, the whole open source the whole stack is an open source stack uh, for for Satnox, uh, and we operate right now on VHF UHF L band and S band and we're still going to be expanding to X band and beyond um, one really interesting aspect and uh, I think that I want to, 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 to focus on today is um, that the ground station network that we have, Satnox, is a crowdsourced network. Um, so basically that means that different volunteers uh, and companies and universities and entities around the world bring in their own hardware um, and join the network uh, in a crowdsourced uh, open uh, aspect. And uh, here you can see just a mosaic of different ground stations um, uh, around the world that uh, are part of the ground uh, of Satnox network. Um, and it just goes to show about the diversity and um, really um, all the different um, uh, things that are brought in um, that are important um, in terms of um, the crowdsourced aspect uh, of, such a, of such a network. Just to emphasize the, the size that you can get to, like in the scale of operations um, through a network that is crowdsourced like uh, Satnox, we are talking right now uh, of um, about a, a thousand uh, ground stations around the world, as you can see here in, uh, in the map, uh, that have at least supplied one uh, successful observation to, to the network. We're monitoring almost 500 satellites uh, in, a, in a scale of uh, almost 10,000 observations per day. Um, and we have close to 100 uh, million packets, uh, mostly telemetry uh, for most of those missions. Um, and this is um, just a, a growing, um, ever growing um, uh, aspect of the network itself. Um, the end game many times for uh, many of those uh, um, missions that are joining uh, Satnox is basically to, to, provide, them, uh, to provide them with um, uh, operational capabilities, uh, specifically around alerting and telemetry and monitoring of what's been happening with their satellites. So in dashboards that we provide uh, uh, for them, like the one that you can see here. Um, but there is also another important aspect uh, which um, we do uh, have activity over the past two years almost, uh, almost uh, through the space situation awareness uh, aspect of the network itself. And traditionally we've been doing that on two different ways, uh, like different people inside our communities um, with passive optical tracking that we've been exploring on how to uh, to utilize it more, uh, but more specifically to about Satnox uh, through passive RF tracking. And what this means is that essentially information that is coming in as a part of observations through the ground station network, and then on that we do identification and tracking uh, of specific satellites. Um, sometimes we combine also passive optical and passive RF sensor data. And ultimately, we uh, through the network itself, we, we can do verification and monitoring of this data uh, too. Uh, most of this tool chain right now is based on top of an open source tool chain um, that one of our core contributors uh, uh, has um, published as an open source project, which the name of it is Satools, uh, and the name of the contributor is Case Basa. Um, and essentially, what this allows us is that through regular observations, uh, we do track specific offsets, frequency offsets, um, which are the result of a Doppler shift, obviously. And from that, we are able to do orbital determination for the specific satellites themselves. Uh, this is just a, uh, a sample, um, uh, an example through a specific Satnog station and tracking a specific um, satellite. And you can see on top what the model predicted on where we would see um, the, the different uh, Doppler shifts and on the bottom, the different observations and how those two correlate basically with each other. And through that, we're able to, through the observations themselves, we're able to uh, do a model fit um, and get pretty close to um, what, uh, in this case, um, space, um, on top you can see the, the, the orbital information is from space track, on the bottom are information from, from our own observations, right? And in, in this corner diagram uh, from an MCMC um, uh, survey, you can see that uh, essentially we are uh, almost uh, as close as one kilometer in this specific orbit uh, in terms of orbit determination and accuracy uh, through our observations from just a single station with a super low cost setup. Um, 
Next steps for us in, in terms of uh, space situational awareness within LSF and SATNOX in, in specific uh, is to explore a more crowdsourced uh, optical tracking um, uh, network. So combine basically the RF aspect of things together with uh, an optical uh, tracking network. Um, the same way that we have like a, a global ground station network essentially uh, to do more automation for orbit and termination steps because right now this involves uh, partially some manual steps on doing this orbit determination and we'd like to automate it more. Focus on a better tier zero data availability. Um, and for us, that means completely free and open source uh, data and in an open data perspective um, that we were able to supply to everyone. Work for Federation with other um, space situational awareness um, data sources and stakeholders. And for us, this is key uh, in order to, to get a, a better um, uh, global picture about SSA. Um, and be part of this um, ecosystem. And uh, finally, uh, we do have um, right now in, in the works an open source satellite identification and localization beacon standard and an implementation on, on top of it. And Cubic, the two pocket cubes that I just showed you, um, are actually part of this early uh, experiment on defining a, a beaconing standard and implementation uh, for satellite identification and localization. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the uh, panel uh, right now. Great. Thank you, Piedos. And it sounds like you guys are doing just really amazing things. We'll be sad to hear more about your stuff during the Q&A. Um, our last speaker um, is Quentin Verspieren, who is a researcher at the Science, Technology, and Innovation Governance Program of the University of Tokyo, where he studies numerous space policy issues, including the modalities of knowledge and technology transfers from advanced to emerging space countries, as well as the role of the military in the definition of international norms for space safety and sustainability. Quentin, it's all you. Thank you, Victoria. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Victoria, for the introduction. And thanks to the organizer from the Aerospace Corporation for the invitation. Um, I am really grateful to be given this opportunity to speak up for University CubeSats um, in a sometime critical SSA community. Um, in fact, I want to show that this is by accompanying and supporting universities that the, the CubeSat confusion can uh, subside. Apart from my main position as space policy researcher and lecturer, I also belong to a CubeSat laboratory at the University of Tokyo. Um, called the Intelligent Space Systems Laboratory of Professor Shinichi Nakasuka, who actually participated in the first uh, CubeSat deployment in 2003. Um, so to make my views clear from the start, I believe that compared to old rocket boosters or abandoned large satellites like Envisat, uh, University CubeSats uh, launched below 400 kilometers and burning in the atmosphere usually within a year are definitely not the main threat to space safety and sustainability. So CubeSat are so valuable because apart from commercial aspect that I will not address, they help to bring space technology closer to organizations with limited resources, universities and um, organizations in developing countries. Uh, in fact, from 2003 to 2018, around 30% of all the CubeSat deployed in space were operated by a university. Even more than reducing the cost of space missions for specific applications, commercial or not, CubeSats were a real revolution because they allowed aerospace engineering students around the world to be able to graduate with a strong hands-on experience and be ready to work for government agencies or private companies without further uh, training. And secondly, we can all agree that space technology has improved every single aspect uh, of our modern societies, in particular in the, the world's most advanced countries. It has bolstered the economy, saved lives, enhanced our defenses, etc. However, for most countries around the world, CubeSats are the only way to initiate a space program and then to progressively build capacity to do things better and safer. This being said, there are obviously issues with CubeSat, um, like all other space systems, the way in which they're designed, the way in which they're operated, have an impact on space safety and sustainability. Most of the CubeSats are not maneuverable, many arrive dead in orbit. Um, they're also extremely difficult to detect and classify, which is the, the main topic of today's uh, discussion, in particular when they're deployed uh, in swarms. 
Um, but now what I want to insist on is the responsibilities for the risk posed by CubeSats. CubeSats do not magically go from a university clean room to space. Um, it involves a launcher and licensing authorities. And I would like to remember once more what has been said by previous speakers that launching states are responsible for the authorization, the continuous supervision of, of space objects, for their registration, and are also liable for any issue that they may cause. And I want to highlight uh, this with two examples of different practices. Um, in Japan, where I am based now, um, most of university CubeSats, uh, including those uh, done in cooperation with foreign countries, are deployed from the Japanese module of the International uh, Space Station that Poncho uh, mentioned in her uh, statement. And JAXA published a payload accommodation handbook that lists all the requirements that should be satisfied by CubeSats to be deployed from the Japanese module. And these uh, requirements cover design, operational, and operational practices. And a very basic requirement is to limit the ballistic coefficient of the satellite in order to ensure that the CubeSat will re-enter the atmosphere within a year after being deployed at a slightly lower orbit than the ISS. In addition, JAXA always chose to deploy the CubeSats in a very loose sequence, allowing a clear separations uh, on SSA sensors. And to my knowledge, this kind of simple practices um, helped SSA operators and everyone in the space field. And there was no real case of adverse impact of any of the, the dozens of CubeSats that have been deployed this way since 2012. On the other hand, I'm personally worried when I read um, declarations of ISRO PSLV officials um, boasting world record deployments of 100 plus small satellites. Um, luckily, in the specific case of PSLV C37, which deployed 104 satellites, 85% were owned by Planet, which thanks to its strong tracking and communication network was able to support the identification of each CubeSat by the 18th Space Control Squadron. However, the situation is not always that fortunate. And, and as showed by Dr. Skinner at the beginning and in his paper shared with the participant of his workshop um, from a figure of Dr. Francesca Letizia um, of 2019 Amos keynote. Um, in the case of swarm launches, 10 to 20% of satellites may never be identified even after six months. And so as extensively discussed in previous session, CubeSat confusion is due to both deployment strategies of launchers and CubeSat design standards. And while the former depends on enforcing standards on launching uh, organizations, which is quite straightforward from the perspective of regulators, um, CubeSat standards um, involves combining, so the enforcement and the promotion of better practices, of better design practices to CubeSat makers. And this is what I want to, to address mostly in, in this uh, short statement. So in my opinion, to, in order to preserve the space environment while not limiting CubeSat's benefits, uh, regulators and leading space agencies actions should focus on four words, stricter licensing, increased support. So state authorizing the launch of CubeSats that may endanger the space environment are legally and morally responsible and therefore need to tighten licensing requirements by including on the CubeSat owner operator side, stricter design and operational requirements as perfectly reviewed in Dr. Skinner's paper. And, and I was glad to hear uh, from the New Zealand Space Agency, the fact that uh, licensing uh, include the demonstration of the trackability of some satellite. However, this increase of um, this tightening of requirements for licensing should be done in the way that preserves the CubeSat benefits. So affordability, simplicity of design, short development timeline. And therefore it should be accompanied by capacity building efforts to ensure that modest CubeSat makers, mid-sized universities or low funded agencies of developing country know how to do it right with limited costs. And again, I exclude here a commercial provider whose job is to make the technology commercially relevant and should not receive government support for that. So universities of advanced space nation can and should be supported by space agency, national research centers, 
or other large universities with government support. And beyond just helping these universities, so the university of your countries, because the attendance is mostly um, American and European, by helping these universities, it is the best way to diffuse the best standards and practices to emerging space countries. In fact, out of the last 12 countries having de deployed their first satellite in orbit, 10 relied on CubeSats, out of which six were supported by a foreign university, actually including four by a single one, the Kyushu Institute of Technology in Southern Japan. So out of 10 latest CubeSat that were the first satellite of a country, six supported by a foreign university, two by a leading foreign space agency, in that case, JAXA and the European Space Agency, and the last two by a foreign commercial provider. So in conclusion, I would say that instead of attacking sometime uh, what I hear, university CubeSats, while at the same time allowing them to be in space, they're not there magically, as I said before, I encourage experts in leading space agency and regulators to be stricter in their licensing requirements while focusing on developing capacity in domestic university by helping your universities and forcing your commercial providers to do it right, you will ensure that everyone on this planet will do it right because university and commercial practices in the US, Europe, Japan spill over the entire satellite engineering world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Quentin, for your spirited support of the University of CubeSat programs. I'm sure they appreciate it. Um, I'd actually like to, uh, we only have a few minutes for Q&A, um, but I'd like to spend the, the five minutes or so that we have left to kind of touching on one of the points that Quentin raised about, um, you know, having these regulations, but also being able to maintain what's helpful about CubeSats. And, you know, for, so I'd like to ask the panel in terms of policies or regulations do you, for SSA for CubeSats, do you think they should be different for CubeSats versus larger satellites? Or is it fair, you know, better just to do a one size fits all sort of regulation at the international level? What do you guys think about that? And whoever wants to take it can start talking. Uh, this is Andrew speaking. Uh, so I, 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 just from a New Zealand perspective, I think probably what we would favor is um, regulating in terms of outcomes. Uh, and maybe being less prescriptive about, you know, the particular technical characteristics of the satellite, because, you know, we're going to see technology uh, on both on the satellite and the, um, the sensor, sensor ground tracking um, side um, continue to evolve. Uh, and I suspect it's continue to get smaller and smaller on the satellite side. So I think it would be less about saying this is a rule for CubeSats or even, you know, smaller PicoSats or, or, or whatever. And more about what is the outcome that we we're, we're looking to achieve, and that's that's something, for example, that we've done on our um, on our small set policy is is basically said you know, we need to demonstrate trackability. Um, it's not tagged to a particular type of satellite, but it's tagged to a size of satellite, but it's not tagged to a particular type. Great, thank you, Pancha. What's your take on this? Now, look, I mean, to some extent, it, it kind of shouldn't make much of a difference. Uh, and I think if we consider the fact that, so, you know, in terms of the UN conventions, the state is liable, um, you know, should a satellite damage somebody else's. So in reality, whether it's a CubeSat or a, a big satellite, you know, the state needs to find ways of minimizing the, the impact of being held liable for any damages. So. I think that, um, yeah, so what, what we try and focus on is just ensuring that the, in, the industry understands the standards that they need to meet as a minimum um, and not so much around creating different regulations for different size satellites. You know. Thank you. Um, Pieros or Clinton? Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, I would say that there is no need for special requirements for CubeSats. They, they don't need to have more facility to go to space uh, compared to others. However, the, um, I would say the, the kind of administrative part of the licensing process should be adapted. So the, the criteria should be the same. They should be tough for everyone. Um, but obviously, when you're in a university lab, uh, let's say it's a big lab with 20 students and a couple of professors. Um, 
no one has neither the expertise nor the time to make a huge uh, documentation uh, to, to get the license, like, I don't know, companies were mentioned before, like Northrop or Maxar, they probably have entire services for that. Um, so the criteria should be as tough uh, as for big satellites, but it should be, maybe people should, regulators should accompany universities in their application, and also it should be cheaper, um, because some of the, the licensing fees could be a big, big part of the cost of a CubeSat. So, so I think these are the, the two levers that should be focused on. Great, thank you. Um, Piotr, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I do have another question for you. Yeah, just really quickly, just okay. singling out um, the size as a determining factor for the regulatory approach. I mean, I, I think that that's, um, that, that's not going to be practical moving forward. It's not the size because that's, there's an under, underlying um, um, assumption there that uh, we're using only active RF uh, as the um, um, technology in order to track uh, the satellites themselves, right? Which is not the case anymore, right? And there are more experiments on passive RF and optical active or passive too. So, and all those sorts of different technologies, right? So size should not be the only determining factor, but rather the actual operator itself and the, the category of the operator, right? Non-profit, for-profit, uh, university or not, like Quentin uh, rightfully pointed out. Great, thank you. Well, actually, that does bring us to time. Um, so please join me in thanking these panels for an excellent discussion. Um, hopefully, you can pick up some of the thoughts that were brought up here um, through the rest of the, the workshop. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Mark Skinner. Mark. Victoria, thank you. Thank you, panelists. That was an excellent, uh, excellent discussion. Um, now it's time to move on to our penultimate talk uh, regarding uh, using lasers for, for tracking things in space. And let me just change my view here. Um, our speaker is going to be Dr. James Bennett, who is the uh, Astrodynamics Group Leader for EOS Space in Australia, and is a Space Asset Program Manager, lead, Program Manager, Program Leader at this at the CERC, the Space Environment Research Center in Canberra. I've uh, I've known James. He gave me a nice tour of the observatories up there, and we've done some nice things at CERC. Uh, James, over to you. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um... So can you see my slides okay? Can you hear me okay? Hello. Hi James, we can hear you on the phone. There are some people having difficulty hearing you through Zoom. Okay, how about now? Does, is that better? Mark says he can hear you. I hear you on the phone. Great. Right. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you on the phone. Excellent. So today I'm going to present some perspectives on using lasers to support satellite identification. James, you need, James to you need to unmute. So I, I had unmuted, I must have needed to do it again. So I assume I'm coming through loud and clear now. Right. All righty, so the, the trend we're seeing with payload Yeah, no, sorry, I keep hitting the, the button on the left screen, it keeps muting myself. So the trend we're seeing is an upward, upward launch, uh, number of payloads being launched into orbit, uh, largely due to improved accessibility, um, introduction of large constellations and, and ride share programs. 
One such rideshare program was the SSOA launch, which was talked about earlier, where 65 odd objects were launched, uh, were injected into orbit. Uh, and this was a program of, with over 35 customers. So quite an quite a involved program to manage. And that was launched on the 3rd of December, 2018. However, two years down the track, and we, we still have unidentified objects. Um, I've just noticed that there is a difference between information sources between Celestrack and Space Track. Uh, so, Celestrack show eight unidentified objects. One of those objects was the RAF M1 satellite. So, this has particular um, impact on the Space Environment Research Centre program uh, due to us having a hosted payload on that satellite where we look to do power measurements of our laser systems um, uh, from orbit. The, this satellite failure led us to investigate another hosted payload, Faraday 1, which also unfortunately failed. So uh, these sort of um, aspects of, uh, have significantly delayed CERC programs in, in the um, goals of demonstrating on orbit uh, remote laser maneuver. So some uh, introductory satellite laser ranging concepts, a trans, uh, laser, uh, laser pulses are transmitted from a transmit system um, from the ground. They are reflected from a satellite equipped with retroreflectors and the reflected pulse is received by the received optics. The time of flight is measured and from this we uh, back out the range. Um, so you can also do this to uncooperative objects or objects without satellite retroreflectors. Um, and we term that debris laser ranging. So the acquisition of such systems can be aided, uh, i.e. using uh, optical guide systems or unaided with blind, blind ranging. Um, for the unaided acquisition, the orbit prediction needs to be quite good. So you can bias the laser around and peak the return signal. We set a range gate around the expected range uh, to look for the signal returns. Uh, an example is shown in the residual plot there uh, for a debris track. Um, where, uh, where we've initially opened up the gate quite wide, uh, typically plus or minus 15,000 nanoseconds, and then we can narrow the gate uh, to improve the signal uh, thereafter. For SLR applications for unaided ranging, typically we, we start off with plus or minus 250 nanoseconds. So EOS currently have two laser ranging sites, one out at Learmonth in Western Australia, and one at uh, Mount Stromlo in the ACT. Uh, the coverage map is shown on the right there, um, where the red indicates the coverage of the laser systems and the blue indicates the coverage of the passive optical uh, systems. So there's several telescopes at each site. So on, uh, at Mount Stromlo, we have a uh, 1.8 metre um, active laser beam director telescope uh, and a 0.7 metre deep space uh, um, passive tracking telescope as well as an SLR system that is a, a low power um, laser ranging system for, uh, as part of the International Laser Ranging Service. And at EOS, we operate this under contract to Geoscience Australia. Site B at Learmonth has two one meter aperture beam director telescopes and 2.7 meter passive tracking systems. So the passive tracking systems are, are also useful in, in this use case uh, as we can house photon counting systems on these telescopes to receive high rate, uh, kilohertz rate uh, signals reflected from the satellite or transmitted from the satellite. So under an aided acquisition, uh, typically we will have a, a few camera systems, a wide field system to acquire the object where the orbital elements are not good. And we use this to uh, get a lock on the signal and guide it to the bore site for the laser uh, engagement. So in this case, um, we're doing that on a debris object for this example, and you can see the laser firing there uh, in the wide field system. So I want to motivate the example by quoting uh, Mark Skinner's paper from the IAC 2020 paper. Um, so <laughs> so uh, this, this image was presented um, in that paper where we're looking at different um, setups of uh, retro reflectors on board a, a, a CubeSat. So in this case, we've got uh, three different satellites with different configurations of retro reflectors. But I will just note here that this could all be the same satellite too and have different 
uh, different sides uh, having different numbers of retroflectors, which is actually the case that we're going to be considering. So the example we'll look at is Technosat, some tracking that we did with uh, for Technosat. Um, so the retroflector setup is shown on the right there, um, where we have multiple retroflectors. Some of the distances are marked um, as well. So we're ranging from 140 millimetres down to 25 millimetres uh, in, in um, the separation of those retroflectors. So here is an example track taken from Stromlo on the 19th of February in 2020. Um, in this case, the range gate uh, for acquisition was set to be 250 metres, plus or minus. And we can see the signal there in the green box uh, being received. So processing this signal, we re receive something like this. And in this uh, process plot, we can see the ev evidence of returns from disparate uh, retroreflectors. In this case, the separation is somewhere around 50 millimetres. So considering another example, this is quite an interesting plot here from the 20th of July, 2020, where um, returns from the retros are, are more evident. We have a stronger peak signal. And interestingly, in the automatic post-processing of the laser signal, uh, this is the signal that's favoured. Um, so there's some work to do in the automation um, routines to be able to pick out this um, the, the multiple retroflectors in this case. Um, but again, we see around 50 millimetres to begin with, and then the, the, the um, signals converge around the time of closest approach. So there's geometry, um, track geometry in, uh, at, on view here. And towards the end of the track, we can see um, return signals from only one of the retroflectors. So I'll comment here that uh, often for this sort of technology to differentiate with multiple retros, we may need more than one pass, or we need uh, passes from more than one site or both. So another, another example here from the 8th of May, 2020, where in this case, the separation between the two signals is, is closer, around 25 millimetres. So we're seeing the application here from a system that hasn't been optimised for this application that we can start to differentiate between different objects based on their retroflector separation. So there's some considerations to take into account. So the, this technology is high TRL. This was, this was using a, an existing international laser ranging service tel, uh, tracking system. But this has on-flow effects if it was to be used for this mission uh, as it may affect the primary mission of the ILRS. So the ILRS network is quite uh, distributed and, and there are a fair amount of tracking sites uh, shown on the world map here. But also there's a performance metric that applied to all uh, sites where um, the ILRS uh, baseline performance is being met by only 36% of, of sites. So there is a, a potential capacity issue that may be faced if um, the sites are to undertake a, an extra mission. Or it might be motivation if it's a commercial arrangement for the sites that aren't meeting the metrics to, to um, add resources to up their tracking rates. So some other considerations is daytime acquisition is more difficult than night. Uh, so typically the signals uh, are not as strong. And we can see this in the Technosat examples um, uh, where I, I've compared the daytime signature to the nighttime. And um, they're definitely, uh, they, they are less, um, there's less returns in, in the daytime. It also makes it harder for aided acquisition, uh, but still possible. Orbital predictions need to be pretty good. So you'll remember that we set a range gate around the prediction. So this, the chance of detection is improved with an improved um, orbital projection. So in this case, um, in early acquisition, the predicts are usually not good. So the assistance of other tracking methods uh, to improve the orbits uh, upon, catalog, upon cataloging and then identification would be good. The systems are weather dependent, so any, any cloud would block the opportunity to um, perform the identification. And as I mentioned earlier, it may take multiple passes uh, from either a single site or multiple sites to differentiate between different signatures. Uh, there also is the chance that if in a ride share arrangement, there may be objects that don't want to be laser ranged. So this is a coordination activity, um, which 
as the number of operators increases, this may get more and more difficult um, or it becomes a condition for a ride share scenario. The other aspect that we can look at is modulating retroreflectors. Um, so in this sense, the, the laser signal is modulated on the spacecraft and then this increases the amount of signature uh, differentials that we can get. Uh, this will uh, assist in, in the, the deposition of um, retroreflectors on, on the small satellites as we may not need as many to because then there's also the case of who has to put three, who has to put uh, two, and, and it becomes a bit of a, an argument because uh, there's cost and payload space involved in all of these things. The other aspect of this and uh, some of the use of the telescope systems is object characterization. So from any sort of light signature that we can, we can perform high rate uh, photon counting. And so this is an example from some of Dr. Daniel Kucharski's work in high rate sampling photometry. Uh, the image on the right there, where we can get quite detailed uh, object signatures and, and Daniel continues to be active um, in this research field. Uh, the other aspect that we're looking into at EOS is using machine learning to uh, back out the opt uh, object signatures and, and James Allworth is the one leading up this research. The other aspect of laser ranging is we can use high energy laser ranging to assist in um, ephemeris generation, high, uh, high accuracy tracking to improve the, um, the cataloging of objects, but also uh, assist with some of the identification techniques. The other aspect of high power laser ranging, um, or in this case, uh, lasers for de-spin or potential maneuver. So this is uh, uh, aspirational goal of the CERC program where we wish to use high power lasers to maneuver objects uh, in space. So passive objects uh, can be nudged out of the way mainly for collision avoidance but in this case we could look at also detumbling um, objects for uh, trying to assist with uh, identification and uh, communication. So in summary laser ranging I believe can assist in the identification of newly launched objects uh, the onboard equipment is passive, uh, require no power, only payload space. Uh, and they're also useful at end of life. So the trackability uh, remains good uh, with objects equipped with retroreflectors. In my opinion, is every object should have a retroreflector. Uh, modulated retros require a small budget, but it is, um, it, it is small in comparison to some of the other methods of, of active uh, transmitting. High energy laser ranging can assist with the uh, with accurate state vector generation, but we have the extra condition that owner operator approval for ranging would, would be needed. Um, it's indicated uh, that CW lasers may assist in payload stabilization, but also potential debris removal for uh, maneuver for um, protection of assets. The high rate photon counting systems can produce high resolution images. Um, so this could be ref for reflected sunlight, sat uh, satellite beacons such as Al the Alroy system, uh, that's of high interest to us, but also reflected laser uh, sources. So um, the, the technology for the telescope systems is, is, uh, can be applied to many of the different techniques for identification. Uh, with that, I'll leave it there, thank you. James, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. I uh, hope we can can uh, meet up again some at some point uh, down in Australia. Uh, Want to thank you, and I know it's a you know it's a long, a long way. The different time zones here, so we're going to go on to our final speaker of today. Um, uh, one of the launch consolidators, uh, Mr. Jeff Roberts. He's one of my co-conspirators uh, in this whole uh, thing here to talk about uh, solving this problem. Jeff is an Army veteran and a commercial space professional who leads all of Spaceflight's mission management. He was the mission director for Spaceflight's historic SSOA launch, which we have heard some from a couple of the, the folks here today. Jeff, uh, I'd leave I'd move it over to you. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? And how much time do I have? 15 minutes. Okay, great. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you for having me uh, at this conference, Mark. I'll give a different perspective from that of a launch provider and launch aggregator uh, focused on CubeSats and microsats. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit first about our SSOA mission, give you a kind of behind the scenes briefing of uh, what I delivered to the FCC as well as to the 18th uh, following the mission so you can kind of understand how it went down. Then we'll talk about Spaceflight's efforts to help uh, address the problem of uh, CubeSat tracking and identification in the future. So for SSOA, um, we, we had a, a total of uh, 64 satellites, customer satellites on board. You can see the breakdown at the bottom here, 49 CubeSats and 15 microsatellites, plus our two free flying satellite deployers on this mission. And there's a picture of the lower free flyer right there, which is basically CubeSat uh, dispensers uh, arranged uh, radially on a central core. So how did it work? Uh, the micro, uh, all the satellites that were supposed to deploy, deployed. Uh, the microsatellites deployed without issue. They were all identified relatively quickly, all unique shapes. Uh, CubeSats of the 49, 48 deployed. One did not deploy. We locked it in its dispenser due to some licensing issues. Uh, of all the CubeSats that deployed, four were not contacted by their customers and were presumed dead on orbit. And interestingly enough, one of the speakers today had one of those uh, spacecraft. But let's get into uh, about uh, reporting and identification. So uh, after we deployed all the satellites, we talked to every uh, one of our customers and, and confirmed that they had positive contact or not with their satellites. Within the first 24 hours, 87% of our spacecraft customers reported contact with their spacecraft. But if you uh, do the numbers, there's 12, as I think um, um, uh, it's been briefed earlier today, that never identified themselves to see Spock. So my bottom line comment here, only four failed on orbit, which is about expected given how many we had. So about a, a little under 10% failure rate, but eight never self-reported their identity. And, and that's a problem. Uh, I know exactly who they are. We've called them, we've emailed them, we've reminded them, we've passed their point of contact onto 18th. 18th has contacted them and uh, they've never provided saying, hey, that TLE or that, um, NORAD ID number, that belongs to me. And, and that's a problem. Uh, you can see over the course of time, how many uh, spacecraft were positively identified by CSPOC. Uh, the number increased, gradually got to 53, which is where it hovers today. And uh, the chart up here shows customers contacting their spacecraft. So as you expect, most contacted within the first day or so, a few more, a few days, a week or two afterwards. Uh, we had one late one. It took a month for them to contact their spacecraft. So uh, we worked very closely with the 18th on this mission leading up to and after, and we got some feedback uh, from the 18th. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, Cynthia was especially uh, helpful here. Uh, some of the comments that we had, uh, it was uh, very difficult for some of the owners to identify their spacecraft, especially those with no active means of identification. Uh, a month after launch, we only had the names assigned to about half of the objects. And one of the CSPOC's recommendations, again, CSPOC won't recommend a specific technology or, or um, application, but they said they, there's more positive means of identification on satellites are needed, and they recommend no passive satellites, of which we had two on this mission that had no uh, active RF uh, communications. Uh, some other things, no secondary deployments. We had one customer, actually we had two customers that were deploying uh, secondary spacecraft after they deployed. That just kind of confused the situation. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the things. Uh, continue to provide manifest, continue to provide separation sequencing and timing. Uh, so some of the things that we, we learned here, we've implemented in future missions. So the major issue with SSOA, which, which kind of surprised us, because up until now, all of our spacecraft customers had identified their spacecraft upon launch. Uh, so this was new territory for us. And we identified that the major issue was with new CubeSat operators on multi-manifest missions. So each of those uh, increases risk to identification, but combine them together and, and it's not uh, an ideal situation. So new spacecraft operators are usually optimistic in their ability to quickly identify their spacecraft and multi-manifest missions, especially with a bunch of CubeSats with the same form factor, uh, make identification uh, challenging. So some of the things that we're doing, uh, we're launching smaller missions than SSOA. We have a mission going up here at the end of next week that has uh, um, 13 spacecraft on it, as opposed to 64. 
Majority of the CubeSats on our current multi-manifest missions are established constellation operators. So that helps. Uh, obviously, Planet's been doing this the longest. They've been mentioned before as having great systems. And we have other uh, satellite constellations that are, uh, are mimicking what uh, Planet's done so successfully. So it's not a whole bunch of, well, one use from various places. It's a, a cluster of five or a cluster of 10 from a specific organization. And we're encouraging but not requiring new customers to have a positive means of identification. Um, there's a, we had some lively debate within uh, spaceflight. Should we require that new satellite operators have an active means of uh, identification? We went back and forth on that and ultimately we decided we would strongly encourage and provide resources, but not mandate it. And the simple reason is if we start putting requirements on that, a lot of our customers will go elsewhere. And this is a challenge I think our entire community faces. As, as you apply regulations or rules, if it's not done across the board, you're driving the responsible rule makers and, and followers uh, out of business while the customers go where it's easier to get licensing, easier to get authority to, to launch. Uh, so that's, some, that's just a challenge that uh, we're all addressing. Some other things that Spaceflight is doing, we're working with LEO Labs to support early spacecraft identification on our multi-manifest missions. And we're also instituted a new initiative to support CubeSat identification tracking technologies by reducing, it says here, reduced costs. We're, we're providing free launches for anyone who wants to demonstrate an on-orbit identification and tracking technology. And I'll get to that more in a second. Uh, so how are we doing this? We're, we're using something called the Sherpa Orbital Transfer Vehicle. Uh, we have three variants uh, here. It's designed primarily for a microsatellite and CubeSat dispensing platform, but it also has hosted uh, payload platforms. Um, so let me move on. One of those, uh, here's an example of a hosted payload from the near space launch. They're providing this uh, hosted payload. It stays permanently affixed. And it's to demonstrate near space launches uh, on orbit identification tracking technologies using the Global Star Network. And there's a picture of yours truly with the uh, integrated uh, CubeSat a few weeks ago. Uh, we're also working with two other companies, so a total of three near space launch and two others, some who are giving presentations to fly their technologies in 2021. Uh, and we encourage uh, other people to do that. We think the Sherpa vehicle is a great platform. Uh, to enable those. And because Spaceflight wants to help uh, be part of the solution, we're doing these launches uh, free of charge. So that would be a great opportunity um, uh, to work with the people on this call to help resolve this problem. Uh, the future of CubeSat identification tracking. So we, uh, again, we fully support the use of active or passive identification and tracking systems on CubeSats. CubeSats seem to be the major issue, not microsatellites. We, we just don't see uh, identification being a big issue for those larger form factors. Uh, there's many different types uh, that are being developed. Again, many which were discussed today, we basically categorize them as active RF, like a beacon, a passive RF, such as our radar retro reflector, uh, active optical, the, the blinking lights, or a passive optical, which, the, uh, the, which is basically an optical retro reflector, um, like the previous uh, presenter talked about. So all those I think are valid. Uh, they have their pros and cons. There's not a single technology that spaceflight cares to recommend or encourage. It's, um, it, it depends on the specific application. Uh, some of the key things is that this system should minimize the impact on the CubeSat if you want CubeSats to incorporate your technologies. And also it's recommended to demonstrate your effectiveness. Um, so uh, that just helps the marketability and the reliability of these mechanisms. So that concludes my very quick presentation. I want to look at some of the questions here in chat because I figure I'll, I'll be getting a bunch. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Actually, I don't see any questions right now. So I'll uh, open it up with a few more minutes left. So uh, thank you. Great, great, great talk. Um, love it. Uh, if, if somebody out there has a technology uh, that is medium TRL and they want to increase it, how would they go about getting a flight uh, on Sherpa? Well, the easiest way is talking to me. I'm, I'm managing the hosted payloads for, for Sherpa. Um, so 
reach out to me if you don't have my contact information, Mark. You're, I'm happy to have you uh, put it out there. But it's not just working with Spaceflight. That gets us. That may get you a launch. Uh, you also need to uh, work with the 18th and others, uh, and other enablers to help. If you're an RF transmission, you need to get your appropriate RF licensing. If you're optical, we need to discuss CONOPS to make sure that you're pointed to the nadir and you're not pointed out in the space. So, so things like that that we'll need to work through on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great answer. And uh, I think we're just about out of time. I thank you for being for being brief. Um, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful chart. We're back on back on session here. So um, thank you. Let me let me have uh, Andrew come back in. Yeah. Hi, Mark. How you doing? Um, it was a great day. We had a lot of great speakers today, starting out with uh, Admiral Haney and uh, wrapping up with uh, with Jeff with Spaceflight. I do want to quickly review with everybody uh, the agenda for tomorrow so you, you know what's coming. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to reconvene at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, and, and that is uh, New York time, okay? And we're going to um, kick things off with a, a short panel discussion with uh, a number of uh, uh, folks from the European uh, time zones. Uh, following that, we're going to have a space safety awareness uh, provider perspective discussion uh, from someone from Leo Labs. After that, we're going to have a satellite operator and systems engineering discussion, followed by uh, a satellite owner operator industry panel. We're going to have a short break, and when uh, we come back from break, we're going to uh, have a space and naval warfare uh, system center discussion. Uh, just providing some perspectives on some, te some technology that they're developing there, followed by a solutions panel where we're going to uh, have a lot of the technology developers that Jeff mentioned uh, discuss their technologies, the pros and the cons, and exactly what technology readiness level uh, they're at. Uh, after that, we're going to conclude with uh, Joseph Kohler uh, discussing the concept of the Space Safety Institute, as well as some regulatory perspectives. Uh, so please join in tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time to continue this uh, workshop. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, I think I think the last presentation um, is a good transition presentation to take us over tomorrow. Which, although we do have some some regulatory talks, which will be interesting. The first things to to accommodate the European time zone. We're also moving more into the engineering and technical solutions. Uh, but I w did want to share a few uh, a quotable quotes that I took down today. I, I enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed several of these uh, bike paths for CubeSats. Um, that was that was good. Uh, another admission to think about uh, tracking and identification from day one. Um, don't expect us to find it for you. Uh, God bless the DOC. Um, and and uh, another one. But this is the new normal. And university CubeSats do not magically go from a clean room to space. So uh, I think we've seen a, a, a wonderful diversity of speakers and opinion today. We've covered several continents, uh, multiple time zones, and uh, I think we're going to have a, a good day tomorrow where we where we pick this up. Um, I'm glad that we are breaking this into two days. This is this is intense sitting here. <laughs> we're listening to all this and taking keeping track of what's going on. Uh, we're we're going to save the chat for people to to look at. Um, and I hope people are going to get a lot out of this and uh, we can we can continue this tomorrow. Um, any final words before we break, Andrew? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good here. Um, just thank you, everybody, for participating and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah, we'll, we'll you get uh, two minutes back of your life. And uh, yes, yeah, so we'll see you tomorrow a uh, few, few hours earlier than today. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye bye.